Yeah, as long as you can see it and show it, that's fine. Even though this morning Visuality was trying to replicate it, and I was too, but you can't manage to replicate a bug, so it, it's hard to tell exactly where it is. Um, but I'm sure we'll find it eventually, and hopefully not uh, during Peter's presentation, not to make him nervous. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome to the launch of the Global Mangrove Watch. I'm just going to give us one more minute uh, as participants join, and then we will start the session. Okay, I will start now and then um, as people join in, we can always refresh. Um, so first, thank you for joining us. I'm Emily Landis. I'm the Coastal Wetland Strategy Lead at the Nature Conservancy. Today marks an important milestone in a years long project to bring Global Mangrove Watch to the world as a resource to drive mangrove conservation and restoration at a scale beyond any one organization. Global Mangrove Watch provides us with the power of information visualized. Thriving mangroves are key to the health of nature and effective climate change action. Global Mangrove Watch is an online platform that provides the remote sensing data and tools uh, necessary for monitoring mangroves. And it gives universal access to near real time information on where and what changes are happening around the world and highlight why they are so critical and valuable. One of the things we're most excited about is the global, how the Global Mangrove Watch advances the shared goals of the Global Mangrove Alliance. The Global Mangrove Alliance is a collaboration of organizations working to increase mangrove coverage by 20% by 2030. We launched it in 2017 to build a global community committed to securing mangroves and protecting the important role these forests play in our world. Today, we've grown to 19 organizations around the world with more than 20,000 experts working on this shared vision. I would like to uh, thank our panel of speakers for joining us. I also want to acknowledge the people that are on this call that have been part of this journey. Uh, this was truly a collaborative effort that spans decades. So just quickly how the agenda will flow. Uh, first, Lambert Hilarides from Wetlands International will provide the history of the Global Mangrove Watch. Anne Henshaw from Oak will give an overview of her organization and why they support this work. Peter Van Eyck from Wetlands International will provide a demonstration and the first live Global Mangrove Watch. Um, Lillian Niaga from Wetlands International will provide context from how it will be used both at the regional, local, and country level. Uh, Peter Bunting will, from Aberystwyth will go through the data sets and then also the future data sets for Global Mangrove Watch. And Chris Steiner will bring it all in from the Nature Conservancy and discuss how this will be used by the Global Mangrove Alliance and also how we anticipate this being incorporated into policy decisions. Um, so the participants on this call are the most important people. So you are the most important people to us. Uh, an important part of getting this launch is getting your feedback. 
Throughout the presentations, there will be polling where we want to hear what you think about the site and how you want to use the site. There will also be 30 minutes for question and answer at the end of the session. You can also post your questions throughout the session on the Q&A board that you can see on Zoom, or if you have comments and thoughts of anything we're showing that might not be a Q&A, there is the comments function so you can provide those comments. So thank you for joining us and I will turn it over to my colleague, Lambert. Thank you, Emily. Um, I can't seem to share my screen. Small hiccup. It can be fixed. Yeah, great, thanks. Okay, uh, first of all, thank you very much for uh, joining this session. Uh, my name is Lambert Hilarides. Uh, I work for Wetlands International. And as Emily said, today marks um, an important milestone for Global Mangrove Watch, uh, and also for me personally. So let me show you uh, the next slide to, to kick this off. Um, this is a sneak peek, a sneak peek of the, the platform, and it shows us uh, the worldwide loss in mangrove extent from 1996 till 2016, uh, where we lost more than 600,000 hectares uh, of mangrove forest in that period. It's not really something to celebrate, but uh, the rate at which we lose mangroves at least seems to be slowing. Um, to get to this number uh, of 600,000, um, many petabytes of raw satellite data were downloaded, turned into meaningful uh, information by many of these different partners over many years of work. And now that this number is in your heads, we can consider it knowledge to be applied, hopefully to benefit uh, conservation and restoration of mangroves. What we try to do with uh, Global Mangrove Watch is to make this kind of information as accessible as possible so that you no longer require uh, GIS and remote sensing wizards to benefit from these latest technologies. So even though this is just a simple number uh, on, a, on a website, um, knowing all the time and effort that has gone into being able to present this number in this way to you today, uh, I'd like to give you a little insight into how we got here and why I feel this is so valuable. Um, so just a bit on the history of, of Global Mangrove Watch. Um, personally, I started working on this over six years ago. Um, from the moment uh, where I met Professor Richard Lucas from Aberystwyth University at a meeting uh, with the European Space Agency uh, in Trascati in Italy. And he demonstrated me this image on screen now uh, from Malaysia near Perak, um, uh, mangrove forests. And each red, green, blue color in that image represents mangrove loss in a different year. Uh, Richard explained to me how something called L-band synthetic aperture radar is really great for detecting changes in mangrove forests. And for those of you that don't know what that is, uh, I was also quite clueless at the time. Um, but my colleague uh, Pete Bunting uh, will cover that later in this session. Uh, these results came from a, uh, an ongoing project at the time called Global Mangrove Watch, a research project under the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency's Kyoto and Carbon Initiative, um, a program initiated in 2001 that aims to support the international science and science community and multilateral environmental agreements uh, with Earth, Earth observation technology. Then, as a research project, it focused on uh, developing methodologies, testing these on pilot sites to map and monitor mangroves in, in different places all over the world. Uh, from that moment on, we, we uh, started reaching out to, to more partners and we've really been building the, um, the partnership. Um, until in uh, 2016, um, some of us, um, 
uh, started the, the Mangrove Capital Africa program sponsored by DLB Ecology, Dutch Foundation. And at the same time, another consortium, uh, amongst others, the Nature Conservancy, IUCN, Cambridge University and NASA started work on the mangrove restoration potential layer. And there was an obvious synergy here. More on that later, um, but in short, we decided to team up. Then in 2019, a generous donation uh, from the Oak Foundation allowed us to improve upon the prototype of the platform, uh, include more data sets, uh, further invest in building the partnership. And most importantly, for the long-term sustainability of the platform, um, we placed it under the umbrella of the uh, Mangrove Alliance. And the portal we are launching today um, is one output in this phase. So what is it that really makes the Global Mangrove Watch unique in, in my perspective? Um, I thought about this and there's really three key things that I want to uh, share with you today. And I'll try and explain with um, um, short anecdotes. So it's the collaborative spirit of everyone involved, the data harmonization and the user engagement. So on the collaborative spirit, uh, Global Mangrove Watch it's a strange combination of, of universities and space agencies and companies and NGOs, but they all share the same passion for mangroves and, and conservation. And as mentioned earlier, uh, when these two different groups of partners uh, joined forces back in 2016, 2017, um, it was Mark Spaulding and Tom Worthington from the Nature Conservancy in Cambridge University that contacted us. Um, uh, when they started work on their uh, mangrove restoration potential map. But to know uh, where you have the best chance to restore mangroves, you need to know where they were lost. And this information was not available at the time uh, with the latest global data sets back then covering a period um, in the early 2000s. Um, global Mangrove Watch, in, then in the context of Mangrove Capital Africa, was working on creating these uh, a time series of global mangrove extent. So we decided to team up, uh, spending time working together, sharing data, and in the end, I think producing much better products than uh, we could have done each on our own. And the next point on data harmonization, uh, that's really a crucial outcome of this collaborative spirit, um, uh, has been that it allowed us to harmonize many different data sets. So as an example, um, I would like to explain you about the, the blue carbon uh, layer. So it, it maps the blue carbon stored in mangrove ecosystems. And you will be demonstrated that later today. Uh, but this layer is actually composed from three different data sets. One on uh, soil organic carbon, one on mangrove extent, and one on mangrove above ground biomass converted to, uh, to carbon. And each of these data sets was produced independently. And naturally, therefore, at slightly different extents. Uh, so when we started to work together, um, this gave us the opportunity to rerun all the models, uh, all the models, um, and uh, harmonize the extent of each of the different layers and merge them into one. And as a result of this, um, each layer on the portal uses the exact same uh, mang mangrove extent. Then on uh, the user engagement, um, if you want information from Global Mangrove Watch to be useful, then you need to make sure that it meets the needs of the users of the platform, the people who use it for conservation, for restoration. And to ensure this, um, at the start of the project, we did many interviews with stakeholders and sort of categorized these into three broader groups uh, that we call yeah, we, we had names for them, but the first one was analysts from afar. So for example, international policy uh, users, science users, or international NGOs, um, mangrove sponsors, donors, companies, or government agencies that want to invest in, in mangroves, and mangrove guardians, so the people working on the ground to conserve and restore mangroves. And we try to meet the needs of each of these different groups on the platform uh, in different ways. And 
to just briefly demonstrate engagement, at least with this last uh, Mangrove Guardian group, I wanted to show you the next image. Um, this is uh, a photo of the Senegalese National Park Service and local stakeholder networks, and also our own uh, local office in Dakar, uh, with participants from Guinea, Guinea-Bissau, from Kenya, from Tanzania also. Um, working with the Global Mangrove Watch team uh, using a combination of Global Mangrove Watch data and drone technology uh, to monitor their mangrove forests. So I'll leave it with this. Uh, this was just a bit of background and history and I hope this provides a useful context for um, the presentations following this. I already know that the next speakers are going to tell and show you amazing things, starting with Anne Henshaw, Program Officer at the Oak Foundation. Uh, thank you very much, and please enjoy the rest of the session. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lambert. Um, I appreciate how much effort has gone into the creation of this platform from many people. So congratulations all around. It really is an honor to be part of this panel. Um, by way of background, I'm a program officer with the Environment Program at Oak Foundation. Oak is a family-led philanthropy that has been supporting ambitious action on both climate change and marine conservation for over 20 years. <clears throat> Oak's interest in mangroves stems from the interest of our trustee um, nearly three years ago. He recognized the enormous benefit mangrove restoration and conservation has in terms of protecting fisheries habitat, coastal resilience, and carbon sequestration, a bridger, if you will, to link multiple, multiple dimensions of Oak's grant-making portfolio. One of the central tenets of our strategy, both on climate change and ocean conservation is transparency. Not only as a prerequisite for informed public debates on environmental policies, but also for achieving meaningful participation in, in decision-making. We also understand that for big data, in particular geospatial data and platforms like Global Mangrove Watch, to have an impact on policy, it must be accessible so that citizens know the information provided to governments and others is credible. Global Mangrove Watch represents a great example of this kind of transparency. We seek to advance being <clears throat> by being open source with interoperability and able to support mangrove monitoring and enforcement globally. Oak is so excited to be part of this launch and uh, we expect it will serve as a valuable resource for many of the partners we support on a variety of issues whether on climate advocacy and supporting countries to meet their nationally determined contributions as part of the Paris Climate Accord, or to more on the ground efforts of communities and civil society organizations trying to protect and restore mangrove forests in their regions. The scalable dimensions of this platform are well designed to meet multiple needs and really serve as an important means to engage citizenry <clears throat> to see and visualize the important role mangroves play on our planet. Oak is just one of a growing number of ph philanthropic organizations either supporting or poised to help resource the full build out of Global Mangrove Watch. I would like to acknowledge Common Foundation, Ocean Kind, the Angel Family Foundation, among others, who also see the value of such a uh, platform. And there's room for more donors to join the effort. Anyone on this webinar is welcome to reach out to me if you have any questions or want to learn more. Um, and with that, can I hand it back to Emily? Uh, yeah, thank you. And I will turn it right over to Peter Van Eyck, who leads Wetlands International's Delta and Coast program. Thank you, uh, Emily. Um, uh, yeah, my name is Peter van Eyck. I uh, work for Wetlands International as the program head uh, of the Delta and Coast program. Indeed, as Emily indicated, uh, and in that role, I've been very closely involved uh, for several years in the development of the Global Mangrove Watch uh, platform. And I have the honor actually to share with you uh, what we've been developing in the, in the last year. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. And well, the honor is to you as participants to this session to, to as one of the first people see the platform live. Um, uh, today is actually the first day that it is uh, publicly available. And I think what has been clear from uh, Lamar's presentation is that you can really make a huge difference if you can get those dozens of different scientists that work on 
uh, mangrove-related maps to work together and develop much more better joint products. Um, I think what Lammert also very clearly indicated is you can make a big difference in getting that information used on the ground by listening to policymakers and practitioners and better understanding what data they need so that you can tailor their needs to what the scientists uh, provide. But in order to provide the transparency uh, that Anne was uh, referring to, uh, the data that you need in, or in order to prioritize action and to find out where mangroves are threatened in different parts of the world, maybe also to monitor what's going on with your projects, how your mangroves are recovering, for example, you need that geospatial information to be presented in an easy way. Uh, so the data, the maps, the satellite images should not be hidden somewhere far away in a scientist's uh, desk. But you need some sort of an interface where even if you don't have a remote sensing background, you can actually very easily access that information for your conservation use. And that is actually what the platform that you can see on your screen right now is, uh, is all about. It tries to, in a very simple way, disclose all these different dozens of uh, data layers so that everyone can play with the data and take out the information they need to support their mangrove conservation uh, work. So if you uh, enter the Global Mangrove Watch platform, uh, the screen that you have in uh, view now is, is what you see. Essentially, you see uh, a map of the world that contains all these dozens of data layers uh, and that you can access. But in order to make it as easy as possible, um, rather than providing uh, the viewer a very long uh, list of data layers that they should click on and off, uh, we use all kinds of innovative uh, techniques that make use of artificial intelligence and cloud computing to disclose and analyze the data for you. And that is actually what you're seeing in the left side of your screen. So we created functionalities that uh, make an analysis of the data layers that are fed in the Global Mangrove Watch system. So if you are having a global interest, you go to the global interface and uh, you might, uh, for example, be interested to learn about the global cover of mangroves in the world. And that's what the first widget, as we call it, does. It provides you information about the total coverage of mangroves in a given year. And you can change the year if you want to compare uh, how uh, mangrove cover changes over time. But there's also nice graphics integrated that show you, for example, what proportion of mangroves are covering the costs. So providing management relevant information at a rather generic high level. But maybe your interest is not just about how many mangroves there are, uh, but you might be interested to see the trends. And then you uh, can scroll down, move to another widget, and you can see from year to year uh, where mangroves are being gained and where they are uh, um, uh, disappearing at the global level. And you can see the trend. So there's still substantial losses, as you can see from the tool, but they differ from year to year. And the biggest losses seem to be over. So there seems to be a somewhat positive trend going on. Maybe you have a specific interest in carbon. And again, using the automated assessment of the system, you can uh, analyze uh, with the Mangrove Watch tool um, what the total carbon content uh, is in mangroves and uh, how it differs in terms of how many tons of, of mangroves or of carbon are covered on a per hectare basis. Another uh, functionality that might be interested, interesting to, for example, global policy makers is to see uh, which countries lose and which countries gain most mangroves from year to year. And again, you can play with the data to change the lists and get the information that you need from your system. Well, as you know, uh, many data layers are of a global level um, and they might be interesting for some, but if you're, uh, for example, uh, a government officer from the country of Tanzania, those global data might not be so interesting to you. You might be much more interested to access national data that are more relevant to your local context. Uh, so that's why uh, we have a, a second level of detail uh, at which you can uh, use this Global Mangrove Watch platform. Uh, you can click on a given country, and then again, uh, it will provide you with country-specific information about what is happening to your mangroves in any given country. Some of the data are based on similar data sets, for example, the data on uh, mangrove cover in a given country. 
But of course, at the national level, there's often much higher detail uh, data sets available that provide much more specific and much more relevant information uh, for a country level. And uh, yeah, that information pops up in your system as soon as you zoom in to a country level. So again, you can scroll through the widget and for a given country, it automatically calculates all kinds of relevant figures, which you can download by clicking on the PDF button so that you have a country report with information on trends in cover of mangroves, but also derived information such as carbon content. Uh, but also you can uh, play with the data yourself. So if your specific query is not answered by the widgets on the left side of your screen, you can actually decide to switch on and off layers in your system. And for example, you can move to a specific mangrove area and uh, watch for yourself, see for yourself uh, where in a specific area the mangrove carbon content is high, for example, and where it is low. Then lastly, you can uh, move to a, a specific site. Um, so we have featured site in the systems. In this case, it's uh, the Rufiji Delta where we have even higher uh, level detail included. And uh, a very interesting tool there, for example, is the uh, deforestation alerts that we included in the system. So by using real-time satellite uh, data, um, looking at uh, the dots on your map, you can see where mangroves are disappearing. And these data become available every few days so every few days, you know where there is sudden disturbances in the mangroves, which might, for example, point to illegal activities. So playing with this map, uh, combining the different layers, looking in the different background data that are fed into the system, you can imagine that there's many different uses uh, for all kinds of different stakeholder groups that can truly mean uh, a change in, in the effectiveness of mangrove conservation and restoration. If you're a policymaker, for example, involved in the, in the development of climate strategies, you might be interested to, at the national level, look at the carbon content in your mangrove system and on the basis of that information, devise strategies for enhanced uh, mangrove conservation as part of the NDCs. But if you are a, a manager of, for example, the area you see now, the Rufiji Delta, uh, if you only have a few hundred uh, euros worth of uh, fuel to patrol an area of, of 70,000 hectares, it might be actually very valuable to have these alerts popping up in your system so that you have some information about where you can best focus your patrolling activities and uh, respond to threats as they emerge on your screen. So what we try to do is really take this global, national and local information, feed it in the system, combine different data layers to make uh, the life of policymakers and practitioners a lot easier. But of course, this is just a start. Um, the, the platform that you're seeing now is a beta version uh, where we included a basic number of uh, functionalities. And in a few minutes, Chris from the Nature Conservancy will tell us a little bit more about how we want to develop this platform further, uh, bringing in many more functionalities and enhancing the use of the tool. Uh, but of course, we would be very keen to also learn from you what kind of uses you would see for this platform? How can this platform serve your work on the ground, whether you're a policymaker or a practitioner? So Emily, I would like uh, to ask you to pop up uh, one of the uh, questions that we prepared for the participants. Uh, we have uh, prepared a poll uh, just to understand yeah, what kind of interests uh, the participants in this team have. So you see there is a, a multiple choice uh, question provided here. Uh, the question being, what data sets are you most likely uh, to use yourself? Uh, so maybe we can take a minute uh, for everyone to fill out this poll question and it should uh, quickly populate the results of the poll so that we can get a bit of a feel of what participants to this session are actually looking for in this kind of platform. So please take a minute to, uh, to answer the poll. And just checking uh, with you, Emily, I think questions should the, the question should be quickly accessible, right? So that we can see the results of the of the question.
Okay, and while I think the poll is being analyzed by the system, maybe we can also pop up the second question we prepared for the for the group. Uh, and here's the, the poll results. Uh, so I think there is a, a clear interest for people to uh, gain understanding on uh, annual mangrove extent change. I can see 68% of the people see there is an interest. And well, I think that makes a lot of sense given that changes in mangrove cover are of course an important basis for any mangrove conservation work, whether it's about work on the ground or policy work that you're engaged in. But it's really uh, nice to see there is also a broader interest in all kinds of derived data, including blue carbon storage and uh, the real-time information on deforestation. Um, and uh, yeah, I would like to uh, invite people, if they have specific recommendations or suggestions of what the platform should uh, be about and what kind of addition, additional data we need to include, I would like to invite you to type your uh, wider suggestions also in the chat box. And uh, yeah, for sure, we will take that on board in uh, further fine tuning the, the platform. Um, so in light of time, uh, let's go on to the second poll question. If we can populate that one, uh, then we can run through that also. So what scale of information is most useful for you? Are you someone who has a, an interest in assessing global trends and values and, and threats? Or would you rather be interested for this tool to be of a national uh, level or more site, provide more site-specific information? So kindly submit your answer. And of course, you might also have a, a combined interest. So while we are waiting for the results of this poll, um, I'd like to already introduce to you um, the next speaker, Lilian Niaga from uh, the Wetlands International East Africa office, um, working on the ground on policy and uh, practice work. Um, yeah, she will provide us some perspectives um, of uh, from the region, from a local level, how this tool can be of use and of uh, value um, before giving her the word, uh, I see the results of the second poll question come up. Uh, it shows there is a very strong interest in site-specific information provided by Global Mangrove Watch. Uh, at least 47% of the people indicates that there is this interest. Uh, this reflects very much also what we've heard earlier, that people do have an interest in global data, but for data to be really useful, they have to have a certain level of detail so that you can apply it locally. And this is therefore also a question I have to you as participants. Um, what we would be very keen to do is to make sure that in the further development of the Global Mangrove Watch platform, we integrate localized uh, data sets. Um, and yeah, if you have knowledge of such data, um, get in touch with us. And uh, yeah, we would be very keen to see how we can integrate that kind of local information to make the tool as useful as possible. Uh, with this, uh, yeah, the floor is yours, Lilian. Thanks. Thank you, Peter. Uh, greetings, everyone. My name is Lilian Nyaega. I work with Wetlands International in the Eastern Africa Sub-Regional Office. Um, following the categorization that Lamart mentioned earlier of the data users during the trial period, I guess I'd fall under the mangrove garden. And today I am honored to present our practical experience from its use already and plans for continued use. And of course, the results from the poll, the last poll that shows interest in site-specific information actually points to this, and that's exactly what I'm going to present. So Wetlands International has, for the past three years, been working in the Rufiji Delta in Tanzania. This delta represents one of the largest coastal mangrove systems of the Western Indian Ocean um, in terms of surface area and biodiversity. It spans over 53,000 hectares and sustains livelihoods of about 50,000 people living both in and around the Delta. However, despite this extensive distribution and the importance, uh, local and external pressures are a threat to the conservation status and the adaptive and productive capacity of these mangroves. 
And some of the pressures which are mostly common in most of the forested areas, not just in Rufiji, include illegal logging and uh, conversion of mangroves for other uses, such as paddy rice farming and um, cattle grazing. As you can see in the middle picture, that's a drone um, of an extensively uh, farmed mangrove uh, area that has been converted for paddy rice farming. And uh, from our studies, we have found that about 7,004 hectares of mangroves have been lost directly as a result of rice farming between 1991 and 2015. So this translates to a loss of about 292 hectares um, every year. And this is not to mention the increased erosion from agriculture and grazing results in high sediment and nutrient loads to man mangrove habitats that reduce uh, their productivity and their quality. And also on the last picture, you can see the invasive species. Some studies that you've done in the Delta have found that the shift in water flows uh, from upstream disturbances have brought down the invasive climber species, what we call Nyangajira, as it locally, uh, which has a negative impact on mangroves as it climbs um, and covers and suffocates uh, the mangrove trees, killing them. So what are we doing to address this and the many other cocktail of threats that I have not mentioned? As part of um, the continent wide Mangrove Capital Africa program, which is supported by DOB Ecology, uh, we are contributing efforts to address these challenges by implementing what we call the community-based ecological mangrove restoration approach in the Rufiji Delta. So this approach is holistic. It was developed by the Mangrove Action Project and it includes stakeholders and um, takes into account the ecological and social issues within the landscape, uh, starting with a detailed investigation of this proposed site. So where we are going to restore understanding the reasons for mangrove loss and why mangroves are, for example, not naturally regenerating as they uh, actually should. So from my experience, uh, the comprehensive information on extent of mangroves and trends of deforestation is largely lacking um, because Sometimes determining the precise area of mangroves is not always easy. And for this, we have been using the Global Mangrove Watch to inform not just the focus, but also progress of our work in the Delta. And here's how um, the Global Mangrove Watch is informing policy and practice in refugee Delta. So in the first instance, working in an area as expansive and diverse as the refugee Delta, um, it is important to identify, first of all, where is the potential for restoration? And using Global Mangrove Watch has helped us to prioritize conservation action by selecting those sites uh, that really require action and putting resources, uh, both human and financial resources, where they are needed the most. So this slide, uh, Peter has already briefly introduced it. It's a screenshot of the mangrove net change. So it shows us where there is mangrove gain, uh, this greenish color, I hope it presents like that on your screens and um, where there is loss. And as, thus, uh, as such, it follows uh, our focus for restoration has been in an area where there is mangrove loss. So we obviously follow to restore where there has been quite some bit of loss, uh, depending on the type and level of contribution that is possible for us. And um, once again, one of the underlying causes to the threats that I mentioned earlier is the inadequate monitoring and enforcement capacity of these agencies. And Peter had already given um, a sneak preview in terms of say, if you do not have sufficient fuel to go to the field uh, to monitor a certain threat. So then this is where uh, Mangrove Watch comes in to increase for us to increase the chances for successful restoration, um, long-term monitoring and management of the sites have been incorporated into our monitoring protocol. And this platform provides us with information, not just on the spatial distribution, but also on the temporal changes of mangrove forests, including um, near real-time alerts on threats. So this makes targeted mangrove patrolling over the large area quite possible um, in a fast, uh, very fast. 
And uh, I think the launch of this platform is timely because as our immediate plans are to work with the Tanzania Forest Service, the agency mandated to monitor forests in Tanzania um, and the local level structures uh, with the mandate for natural resource management monitoring such as the beach management units and the village natural resource committees by first of all, strengthening the enforcement capacity to be able to act um, on alerts in a timely manner. And this slide actually gives a good picture uh, of the alerts. Uh, for example, we have had uh, 110 mangrove disturbance alerts between April 2020 and May 20, uh, April and May 2020. So it just very quickly shows us where these threats are. Um, and you can be able to act on it given the resources that are available. And I think not just that, but mangrove restoration also faces um, a diverse uh, socioeconomic issues that compromise the long-term sustainability and um, challenge the implementation at a landscape scale. So with this data over time, uh, when you look down, you're able to download this data. I think it, it gives us uh, the capacity to analyze when uh, and where are the disturbances happening and at what frequency. And from this, we are able to, um, in a participatory manner, develop uh, lasting and acceptable solutions to address these threats. Um, so we have also used uh, mangrove extent and change maps and other data such as that on um, biomass to inform the development of refugee man mangrove management plan and also the harvesting guidelines. So we are facilitating this review, um, which is coordinated by the uh, national entity, Tanzania Forest Service Agency, and the plan is actually near completion. Um, in addition to this, referring to international agreements, and I had this mentioned um, last Friday during the launch of the Western Indian Ocean Mangrove uh, Ecosystem Restoration Guidelines, is the need to the gap that is there on nationally determined contributions in terms of accessing recent quantitative data and information, including that on total mangrove carbon storage. And this is also a challenge in Tanzania, and it has been mentioned already. Uh, through one of um, our uh, initiatives, the Save Our Mangroves Now, which brings together the German Ministry of Economic Development, um, IUCN, and WWF, we are in discussions on how this climate data can be mined from the platform and of course complemented by other sources and how we can then translate this information to address these policy gaps. Lastly, um, this platform provides stakeholders, some of whom are present today in this webinar with an opportunity to build and strengthen these partnerships around what works and what doesn't. And from these lessons, I believe that we can gently develop workable strategies starting from the local level towards conservation of mangrove ecosystems. And I'm also happy that um, the platform is dynamic. Our field staff have been trained in gathering data using different methods, including drones. And from this, we are able to um, feed information from the ground that helps to improve this platform. And then I think results um, into even more accurate data. And as Lamart mentioned, um, this information should be as accessible as possible. And therefore, for this tool to be useful to us, the science for it um, and behind it really has to be the best in class. And I think so far it, it has been useful to us. And I think it continues to improve uh, from where we are right now. Um, and now I'm pleased to turn over the discussion to Pete Bunting. We'll talk about the science powering Global Mangrove Watch. Thank you. Great. Right. Um, thank you very much. Um, so I'm Peter Bunting. I uh, work at Aberystwyth University in the UK. And um, uh, with uh, colleagues, particularly Richard Lucas um, and Orke Rosenquist, um, we've been working over a number of years uh, around this uh, concept of uh, a global mangrove mapping. Uh, and then through uh, work, particularly with LAMA at Wetlands International, but also more recently at the um, 
with people like Emily at the TNC who've actually really been seeing this kind of vision coming to life. Uh, and I also want to credit uh, Nathan Thomas, who, who did his PhD here in Aberystwyth, and he'll be talking in the second se second session, um, who has also put a lot of work into the background behind this, uh, behind this work. So um, I'll be just quickly talking through uh, the background of how we create the, the baseline maps, uh, which have gone into this uh, product. Uh, and then uh, from there, how we then look at change. Um, the products which uh, you've already been shown on uh, above and below um, bio and program biomass, uh, and then finally the deforestation um, alerts. So uh, as Lamet said um, in the beginning, uh, we had a, uh, a large amount of collaboration with, uh, with JAXA, the Japanese uh, Space Agency, as part of their Kyoto and Carbon Initiative. Um, and that has guided a lot of the data sets that have been used uh, in the products um, to this point. Um, so in terms of the, uh, the change maps that will come onto, uh, those years are defined by the data that was available from JAXA. Uh, for um, the baseline mapping, we chose the year 2010. Uh, and this is because that was the, uh, the year where we had most coverage of this L-band radar data. Uh, however, what we found is that as we uh, kind of worked with the L-band radar, ability to be able to discriminate mangroves from other uh, forested vegetation types uh, was sometimes limited just using the L-band radar data on its own. Um, so therefore we created um, a Landsat, um, which is optical data. So seeing in the wavelengths of the visible to the shortwave infrared parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, so we made composites of that imagery uh, over all the mangrove regions to help us discriminate uh, between mangroves and other vegetation types. So that produced a, uh, a global uh, baseline map uh, for 2010, um, which is the, if you go to the 2010 uh, layer within the, uh, the portal, that's the layer that you're seeing. Uh, the accuracy assessment that we've done uh, from that would say that the, the accuracy is around 94%. Uh, that was uh, uh, statistically derived uh, by looking at um, 20 different sites. Obviously, if you zoom in uh, to different sites, uh, accuracy will vary, but this is the, uh, the global accuracy uh, of those products. And, and just to illustrate what I, why we need to uh, use the, the radar data uh, alongside the optical data, uh, the top images here illustrating what a lot of the optical uh, um, data looks like over the tropics, uh, where we have large areas of cloud. Um, the green area is the, uh, is the global mangrove watch. Uh, baseline, as you can see in the top layer, you can't see many mangroves uh, with all those clouds. And the radar data allows us to see through that cloud. Um, however, as you can see in the lower image uh, for the same area, uh, this uh, kind of, um, or I guess, um, ready orangey color, uh, where my cursor is over, this is an area of mangroves. Uh, and as you can see the, in the optical data, when we can get it through the um, cloud, it gives us, um, in most areas, good discrimination between mangroves and uh, many of our other vegetation types. And it's this fusion of the L-band radar data um, and this optical data that has allowed us to, um, to undertake uh, the mapping. So as you've already been shown, uh, this is then what that baseline looks like within the, uh, within the portal. So looking at the change, uh, being able to, at the time we uh, with we're doing these change maps, uh, looking at creating optical uh, composites or optical products um, across all the different timelines that we were, uh, we wanted to be able to map, uh, we felt was probably unrealistic at the, given the compute capacity we had at the time. So we really focused on these uh, JAXA L-band um, synthetic capture radar products, uh, mainly because they give this um, cloud-free coverage uh, and JAXA were providing uh, data which was already mosaic on a one by one degree tile basis. So if you haven't uh, worked or seen radar data before, uh, it's quite different to the optical data. But the optical data is allowing us to see um, similar structures and similar way in which we would be looking at with our eyes, just extending into the near infrared and the short wave infrared part of the electromagnetic spectrum. While the radar or um, synthetic aperture radar, which we tend to use the acronym SAR. Uh, so what the SAR data uh, is sensitive is to essentially the vertical structure um, so if we think about mangroves, where we've got our mangrove trees, that's giving us uh, a high vertical structure. 
uh, and the radar um, signature scatters within that vertical structure and we get a high signal coming back. Uh, where we have areas which are, have got no vertical structure, so smooth areas like water bodies uh, and mud flats, uh, these are um, kind of have a very low ba um, radar back scatter. Um, and therefore, we can differentiate uh, by knowing the context um, whether we're looking at mangroves or um, these kind of water bodies or mud flats. Um, and in this video here, let me just, uh, I'll just go back a, a step. What you can see here is on the left hand side, you're seeing the uh, JRS 1, the Japanese Earth Resources Satellite from 1996, the um, ADOS Pulsar um, data in the middle uh, from 2010, and then 2016 you're seeing uh, the Los Pulsar 2 uh, instrument. Um, in 1996, this is uh, Kilimantan, in, uh, East Kilimantan in uh, Indonesia. Uh, you can see that the majority of the, the mangrove areas are, are white in this image, so they've got high backscatter. So there are mangrove trees. Uh, as you can see in 2010 and then 2016, what you can see is a lot of low backscatter areas, so these, um, these dark areas. Um, and this is um, where the forest has been cut down. So now you're looking at um, uh, um, shrimp ponds, um, and you're looking at um, those having a, um, a low backscatter. So if we can combine that into a color composite, what you'll see is that the red areas, these are areas which had a high backscatter in 1996, and then low backscatter in 2010 and 2016. And essentially what you're looking at there is these are the areas of mangroves uh, that have been cut within this area. And we have a change detection process that uses that 2010 baseline um, and then looks to map uh, these areas of high change, both going back to 1996, uh, but also going forward to 2016. Um, and this is an example uh, of one of the maps in the same color scheme, um, just so you can see the areas that were being mapped. So it's these um, smooth water bodies and mud flats uh, giving us low backscatter and then our mangrove trees giving us this uh, heart large vertical structure that allows us to differentiate um, and find these change areas. So the, uh, the maps that um, have been uh, produced to date um, are 1996 from the JRS-1, the Japanese Earth Resource Satellite. Uh, we then have quite a gap um, up to um, 2007, uh, which is why in some, if you just look at the statistics on a linear scale, you'll uh, see that there's quite most a lot of the change is looks like it's between 1996 and 2007. It's this uh, fact that we don't have the uh, um, any kind of um, dates in between that at the moment. Uh, then we've got 2007, 2008, 2009, and then 2010, which is also our baseline year uh, from ALOS Pulsar. And then we've got ALOS Pulsar 2, uh, which is um, 2015 and 16, and we're currently in the process of uh, processing 2017 and 18, so they will be um, available uh, shortly. Um, in terms of the accuracy, the accuracy assessment we've done so far from that change um, uh, would indicate that um, our change is around 75% uh, accurate um, across um, at, a, at a global um, scale. Obviously, if you do zoom in and look in very local sites, you might find that um, in some areas it's uh, the accuracy is much higher and in other areas the accuracy is lower and uh, where you are finding areas where the accuracy is uh, maybe lower than we would hope then please feed that back because that really helps us to improve uh, these products um, going forward. Um, these uh, statistics you can download uh, from the portal um, so this is just the global area uh, from all the years we have processed alongside the percentage of uh, the, the kind of net change so you can see that between uh, we're, we're mapping a net loss uh, of a uh, foot just over four uh, percent over the the areas, but obviously kind of there's, there's the loss is much higher because it's being offset by by some of the gain. But um, as, as you um, use the portal, uh, you can download these statistics globally, or you can do them nationally, or you can look in uh, some of the protected regions um, as uh, as you've already been shown. Um, through the portal, you can also get these visualizations. So this is that same area that we looked at um, in the video where you can um, actually see this change visualized and you can choose which years you want to um, um, to, to be visualized uh, for you, uh, which is uh, a really nice tool. Um, you're also shown in the uh, portal, uh, we've got layers in there uh, which um, for blue carbon. The above ground carbon, 
component is from a study um, from Shamad et al, 2019, the reference is at the bottom in Nature Geoscience. Uh, and this study um, looked at doing a global map um, of um, above ground biomass and mangrove height. So what you're looking at there is they made, they used a, a global digital elevation model. So that's giving um, the, the height um, above the ground. Um, and this is the um, um, shuttle um, radar topography mission uh, from the year 2000. It's an elevation model that was acquired from the, uh, from the, uh, from the space shuttle. Um, and there was a, because mangroves are in a low elevation, there was a key assumption here that those elevations, uh, because the, the instruments was basically sensing near the top of the, of the canopy, um, that those uh, elevations are highly correlated to the height of the mangroves. So therefore, a relationship was created between these elevations from the SRTM uh, to mangrove height. And this has resulted in the mangrove height layer that um, you'll see within the portal. Uh, another key assumption is then that mangrove height um, is then highly, uh, it's got a strong relationship to the uh, total bi above ground biomass uh, of the mangrove um, trees. And then a relationship again was developed using field data um, to get at um, that variable of, uh, of above ground biomass. So at, the, um, at present, this is the, uh, the best publicly available or widely available um, um, mangrove uh, biomass product, um, above ground biomass product. And we've, uh, using this analysis, uh, using the, the method outlined here uh, within, the, uh, within the paper, we've then re uh, cut that to the GMW extent. So it's at the same extent as the, uh, as the layers that we've just presented. Uh, the below ground carbon, um, is from the study of Sandman, um, 2018. Uh, this process is looking at uh, um, below ground carbon and it develops a machine learning model using the random forest algorithm um, to a number of envir um, environmental variables um, which are available such as the, the tree cover, um, SRTM again, um, sea surface temperature, the tidal um, elevation, suspended soil matter, uh, mangrove typology. And um, this study uh, was was published before the, uh, the Global Mangrove Watch uh, um, data layers were available uh, and through the, uh, the Nature Conservancy um, and organized by Tom Wellington at the University of Cambridge, um, the, uh, the, this analysis was redone and cut to the um, Global Mangrove Watch extent layers. So the combination of those two layers um, is what gives this uh, blue carbon um, layer which you can uh, interact with in the portal. And then as you were showing, if you go into a kind of a, a, a a, a closer zoom level, you can then um, see the mangrove height and above ground biomass layers um, individually as well. So the other layer that we have is uh, these deforestation alerts. So the annual maps um, that we've been producing that are on the site, you can think of those as looking at the historical context and they're always going to be produced almost like a year behind when any change occurred. Uh, because we're going to have to wait until at the end of 2020, so we're going to be into 2021 before we start looking at producing a, uh, a 2020 map. So you're always looking at this historical context. So it's telling you what has changed rather than allowing you to uh, be interactive and kind of responsive uh, to any change. And the idea behind these alerts um, is that we're trying to look for um, things as soon as we can um, to be able to provide um, uh, these alerts have changed and these videos uh, are showing you some areas of, of mangroves using the, uh, the European Space, Lease, uh, Space Agency Sentinel-1 um, um, C-band radar data uh, and what you're looking there is a video on loop where you're seeing um, some changes occurring uh, within the mangrove areas. So the data sets that are going into these um, alerts are the Sentinel-1 uh, from the European Space Agency. So this is uh, radar data again uh, but it's what we call a C-band radar. So it has a, 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 a smaller wavelength, uh, which isn't as good for mangroves as the L-bands from the, from the Japanese Space Agency, but it does have this regular coverage. So globally, um, every two weeks, we get a complete coverage um, and it's cloud-free, which in these tropical regions, as we've already said, is really important. Uh, we're also using the Sentinel-2 instrument, which is an optical instrument, uh, which does suffer from cloud cover, but again, also provides um, coverage is every two weeks. And then with Landsat 8, um, here we're getting a slightly lower spatial resolution, um, but we're getting every 16 days. So we use all three of these um, uh, sensors to produce uh, these alerts. 
So um, within the um, data sets, what we're looking at is we're saying that we've actually got a history um, using the most recent annual um, GMW mask. We're actually just looking within that context. So we've really uh, kind of narrowed down the area that we're looking at, which has meant that the kind of remote sensing analysis uh, that we perform can be actually um, relatively simple. Um, so we just have some basic thresholds that we apply basically to say, is this pixel vegetation or not vegetation? If we, it was in our, in this context, 2016 annual mask of mangroves um, that uh, you can look at on the portal, and our satellite imagery is telling us that it's not vegetation. So we use this index called the normalized uh, um, uh, vegetation index from the optical data from Sentinel-2 um, and Landsat, and then we have some backscatter thresholds for the Sentinel-1. If we're saying it's not vegetation, then this is a potential uh, change alert. Those um, change alerts are then summarized onto a 60 meter grid uh, for presentation um, onto the, uh, the portal. To try to, um, obviously, with the, particularly with the optical data, you do tend to get occasional false positives due to uh, cloud cover, um, which has not been fully masked. Uh, and things like that. So we want to uh, be sure that we're trying to show you uh, deforestation alerts, uh, which are reliable. So we want to have a number of satellite observations of a uh, potential change alert um, for a pixel that's potentially changed before uh, we, result, uh, we, we upload it to the portal and say, here's a change. Uh, so we have a process where we score pixels. So each time a Sentinel-1 observation um, um, detects a change, we add a score of one for a pixel. For the optical data, because they're uh, with cloud cover, much more infrequent observations, uh, we add a score of two. Um, if we have an observation uh, for the same area and a pixel uh, which has previously been identified as a potential change is not identified as a change, then we remove one from that score. So this score can go up and down. Uh, once that score gets to a score of five, then we deem that there's been several observations, uh, at least three, a minimum of three. It could be quite a few more um, uh, observations have, uh, have seen that this pixel um, is a change. It then gets defined as a permanent change um, or a reliable change. And therefore, we, uh, it then gets uh, amalgamated and put into the portal. So we have this um, relatively simple rules within our uh, Global Mangrove Watch mask. And then we have this scoring process uh, gives us um, some more idea that uh, the, these change alerts are, are reliable. So in terms of the processing for these alerts, we're currently doing the processing uh, across the whole of Africa. Um, although in, is the, in the portal at the moment, uh, we are missing some countries because we're still doing further QA tests on those uh, deforestation alerts to ensure that we're, we're giving you accurate data. Um, so uh, these countries here, Senegal, Gambia, Guinea-Bissau, Ghana, um, Ivory Coast, um, Nigeria, Mozambique, Kenya are currently uh, omitted from the portal um, as it stands, but they will be uh, going up in due course and the, the data that sits behind them has already been processed. Um, as you've already been shown, this is what um, those deforestation alerts look like uh, within the, uh, the GMW portal. So in terms of the data sets, the, the Global Mangrove Watch extent and change um, and alerts are going to be provided uh, within a Creative Commons license. And so those data layers uh, can be downloaded. The, the, the um, GMW um, Mangrove extent and change are already available for downloaders um, as GIS layers. We're currently undertaking um, some work. Uh, we've ident um, uh, been identified some areas, particularly in the kind of small Asian nations, particularly in the Pacific, where uh, there are areas that have been missed out of the, um, the mangrove baseline mapping. Um, so we are currently also doing a piece of work just to, to fill in some of those gaps. So you will see an update um, to those over the, uh, the coming months. Uh, and if there are any areas that you find that you think have been missed um, that should have been included in that, please again, uh, feed that back to us because we want to um, get these data layers uh, improved. Um, and then for me personally, looking forward, um, depending on kind of time and uh, kind of financial resource to be able to put into these, I think we'd really like to see uh, the kind of coverage of the deforestation that's expanded. Um, we'd like to see um, uh, the annual uh, maps be going to Sentinel-2 to give us that higher spatial resolution, uh, we, um, which I think certainly when we get to, when people want to look more of a site level could be really helpful. 
Uh, and also um, the, the Landsat archive being available, we could go back uh, further in time with a higher temporal resolution. Uh, these are all some quite large data processing tasks. Um, uh, more immediate layers that I think will be uh, going into the, um, uh, the, the portal um, in the not too distant future, things like uh, the mangrove, um, whether mangroves have been degraded, so degraded index, ecosystem services, biodiversity hotspots, um, restoration potential, and, uh, and, and then drivers of change. And these are layers that uh, within the kind of wider Global Mangrove Watch um, uh, collaborations people have been working on um, and producing uh, these layers. And I think we have a, um, a poll uh, for, for you guys to take again. Um, so maybe if we can get the, the poll up, which will be asking you about kind of which of these layers um, you think is um, kind of would be priorities um, going forward. So I guess we're, we're just waiting on the results of those. Um, and once I'll be um, handing over to, uh, to Chris, um, he'll then be, he's from the Nature Conservancy, uh, who's going to talk a, a little bit more uh, about what's, what we're already working on. Uh, but I guess we'll just wait for the, the poll results to come back before Chris uh, takes over. Yep, we still have a lot of responses coming in. So I'm gonna give it another, maybe. Five seconds. Oh, yeah, sounds good. Okay, so I guess we've got a, a people are interested in pretty much all of the different options. Uh, restoration potential probably comes out uh, uh, just just winning there, um, and uh, that's something that um, Tom Worthington and the guys at um, uh, the Nature Conservancy have done a lot of work in. Uh, with others, so um, so that's a, a layer that I'm sure will be going in there. Okay, so uh, Chris, over to you. Thank you, everybody. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. I'll take that head nod as a yes. So um, yeah, as as uh, as Pete said, thank you, Pete. That was a great presentation. Um, I think the the real value of Pete's presentation is just to show you all the the great science and the time and the level of detail and effort that's been put in to the science behind this platform. It, it's really you know, there's nothing else like it out there yet. And as he said, in a couple of those data sets, they are uh, probably the best, some of the best data sets uh, that exist concerning mangroves uh, globally. So it, it's great that they're part of the platform. Um, yeah, as Pete said, I'm Chris Skiner with the Nature Conservancy. I, I work with Emily and uh, work with uh, helping coordinate some of the science activities and science work of the Global Mangrove Alliance members. So I, I, generally don't like to start out with a sports analogy, but I think I have to, you know, you can always tell how a season is going to go for a team by their first game. And if Peter's live presentation of the app was anything, it was, it was extraordinary. Uh, many, many times live presentations of a, of an app uh, don't work for some reason, but I think uh, this was a, a great example of, the functionality of the app um, and and the great uh, visualization and data resources that exist. So, uh, a lot of good applause. Hats off to Peter and the and the team that uh, helped develop the app at Wetlands International. So, yeah, I want to I want to get into a little bit, of, you know, just a, a broad overview of the tool. Sort of try to wrap things up. Uh, what some of the different presenters have talked about. 
I did, I did see some questions coming in about, I want to address right away, some questions coming in about uh, users being able to uh, provide or input data into the platform. And that is definitely something we are looking for in the future. I think, uh, as Michael Crispino from WWF said, you know, this, this tool is nothing without its users. And we're going to eventually create a mechanism that people in the field, other scientists are able to upload and ingest their site specific, their site relevant information uh, to, into the platform as a means to demonstrate their work, to show their work to the broader community, but also to uh, help them visualize and, and understand the changes that are going on. I think Lillian made a great example and Peter made a great example of using the application to reduce fuel costs for, for mangrove patrols and monitoring. I think this is a great, uh, a great example of how science meets the practitioner for providing valuable resources and insight to help them do their jobs better. Yeah, you know, we're also going to look at in integrating just some drone imagery, um, just to add to what Peter said, we want to bring in socioeconomic data because we understand that, you know, millions of people live in or adjacent to mangrove habitats. Many of them depend on these mangrove habitats, both for resources and, and protection and resilience to climate change. So understanding how people and communities live, uh, coexist with mangrove habitats and help, help that uh, situation improve and benefit from successes where that situation flourishes and both the communities and the mangroves flourish we want to begin, begin to put some of that data and information into the app as well. So going forward, um, as you've seen from the presentations, there's a lot of science in this application. Um, it's been developed for over years uh, from people with universities, NGOs, our colleagues at the IUCN Mangrove Specialist Group, and local researchers and practitioners like many of our intended users and audiences. We want to share the information so that we can understand the value and the mechanisms to protect and restore mangroves. Because like I said before, you know, these benefit people, they, they help mitigate climate change, they build resilience against the, uh, the effects of climate change going forward. So we need to understand the value that these ecosystems provide and the services that they provide. We, we want to take advantage of, of policy and funding mechanisms so that we can help elevate the role and the profile of mangroves into policy discussions. We want to, we want to bring in uh, financial incentives and opportunities to help restore and protect mangroves. This is key. And also, you know, working with the Global Mangrove Alliance, 20,000 plus scientists, as Emily said in the beginning, uh, you can't you can't find a, a, a bigger network anywhere. And to bring this data available to our huge network of mangrove scientists and practitioners, I think is key and something that the Global Mangrove Alliance will be focusing on heavily in the future. So why is this important? Well, we all know the reason to that, but the United Nations has called this next 10 years the decade of restoration. And this is in order to provide food security and mitigate changes to uh, mitigate climate change and its impacts, as I said before. But, you know, we also want to improve community well-being and livelihoods through economics and job creation. To look at focus on those activities that benefit both the communities and mangrove habitats. 50% of the mangroves globally have been lost in the past 50 years. This rate is continuing to increase anywhere from 1% to 2% annually. We're losing mangroves. So this has to stop. Protection is key. We do understand that. We have to prevent the, avoid, pre pre prevent the conversion of mangroves. But we also need to restore the mangroves that have been lost. This is going to be key, too. And one of the, one of the key elements in the future of the tool will be what we're calling the mangrove restoration framework and tracking tool. This is being developed by our colleagues at Cambridge University, Tom Worthington and Yasmin Gatt, along with our colleagues, our GMA colleagues at the World Wildlife Fund, Dominique Adrani-Brown and Gabby Amadia, 
they're working to develop an inventory of mangrove restoration projects worldwide, develop a standard reporting framework, and all of this will be ingested into the Global Watch Mangrove platform. So here you have now in one location, one place, a accounting of mangrove restoration projects around the world, all using common or standard reporting structures. That way, users around the world can see what other restoration projects are doing, how they're succeeding, the, the, the methods that they're using. And in years to come, we'll be able to monitor and track our success. Are the restoration projects doing what they intended? If they're not, we have to adjust and figure out why. But doing this in sort of a unified standard format available on the platform, this will enable, I think, much faster restoration activities, a better sharing of information and knowledge. And we're very excited to have this, this, this module come in some of the next iterations of the tool. Emily mentioned that it's very important that policy and economic opportunity, uh, economic incentives are directed towards mangrove habitat protection and restoration. So currently nationally determined contributions to the 2017-2016 Paris Accords will not, as they stand now, will not get us to a two degree future. We need to enhance, we need to ramp up our level of ambition. Countries need to up their emissions reduction targets. 93 countries around the world, 93 out of 193 roughly, mention nature as a mechanism to help reduce their overall emissions, their overall annual emissions. I'm happy to say that most countries, with the exception of a few uh, uh, countries that have mangrove habitat are in this category. So we're good there. Mangroves are being considered as a, as a mechanism to help reduce countries' emissions, and that's great. But we need the platform. We need information like this to help them make that a reality. The carbon data, above ground, below ground carbon data that Pete mentioned, that's so cutting edge, best available, out, best available data that's out there. This is going to directly feed in to the emissions reduction schemes that countries are providing. And now we'll have a mechanism to get the mangrove information, account carbon accounting into countries' NDCs and be able to quantify through protection and restoration the amount of emissions they can help that country reduce. Ecosystem services obviously are, are key to this as well. Mangroves are more than just carbon. In fact, they're much more than just carbon. They provide uh, uh, livelihoods for communities. They provide uh, resilience to changes uh, that are coming with climate change. It's been shown that ecosystem services per hectare are valued at somewhere around 40,000 US dollars per hectare of mangrove. So the, the, the need and the benefit of pr protecting and preserving these mangroves is, is paramount for the services that they provide. So this is our policies. Did you lose me? Now we hear you, Chris. Okay. I can can you still see my screen? My Zoom is no. reconnecting. You cannot we, see my screen. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um when okay. Well, let's just get into financing real quick and then we'll quickly wrap up because we are a little bit behind time. So uh, the it's it's critical that countries increase their ambition, as I said before, with their NDCs. And how do we do this? We, we do this by providing economic incentives to protect and restore mangroves. Uh, we do this by looking at voluntary trading schemes for mangroves. We do this by standardizing voluntary markets through, issues, through groups like VERA. And the Global Mangrove Watch is going to play a key role in this prioritization going forward. So just uh, quickly to sum up, we will bring together the best available science. We'll continue to gather and coordinate researchers, users, practitioners to help make the tool better, to understand what we need, to understand what the audience needs. We wanna link people 
to place and practice. So the advantage of doing this is that you have many users doing many different projects around the world that can learn from each other, learn what works and what doesn't work. We want to engage other partners that are doing similar activity, bring them in both to the GMA platform world and the Global Mangrove Alliance, groups like the Blue Carbon Initiative, groups that have a broad reach, maybe a reach into the audience that we're currently not as well exposed to. The other benefit of working with the Global Mangrove Alliance is communications. It's a great avenue and network to tell stories and engage audiences uh, through media and communications campaigns. So it's more than just science. It's about getting the word out there, getting science out there, demonstrating how this benefits the work that everyone needs to do from policy to restoration, to research, to financing, to protect and preserve mangroves for the future. Thank you. Thanks, Chris, so much. So we're about 10 minutes until the end of the session. Um, we will also provide an email address for you to send your questions or your comments if we aren't able to address them right now. Um, we will also share in the chat box some of our websites and ways to follow us and just to continue this conversation. So I would like to start by asking, I think, uh, Pete, there's a few questions on uh, species distribution, specifically around mangrove species and how that might be incorporated into future maps. I wondered uh, if that's a, possible, a possibility to actually even separate between species um, and how could you maybe think about doing something like that if possible? Okay, so um, from a remote sensing point of view, I think there are areas of the world where you can see some uh, differences in species. Um, Richard Lucas and myself have looked at some areas in Northern Australia, for example, um, and certainly in some, some imagery data sets, we particularly looked at some higher resolution data from rapid eye um, at that point, and you could see differences in species. Um, I think the, the difficulties is it's not consistent worldwide, so you would have to do localized studies um, to separate species and it, you might find it's possible in some areas but then in other parts of the world uh, it might be quite difficult to or, or not possible to do that separation so um, it might be something that is uh, possible in some areas but not in others does that, does that sort of make sense that's great I, does anyone else want to add anything Lambert maybe this question If not, I will move on, but this one, it, Lamert, this will be for you. Um, oh, there's a few questions in here about data validation and utilizing some uh, people in the uh, Q&A have indicated that they have finer resolution data at the country level. And is there a way to integrate that data into future iterations of the Global Mangrove Watch or ways for us to zoom in on that data? Yeah, thank you, Emily. Um... Yeah, Peter and I were just looking at all the questions and all the, the spontaneous offers for uh, um, for this data, which is really great. Um, <clears throat> so how we can use this uh, data, so please get in touch if you think you have data that's valuable, is we can um, use it to, uh, to build a training data set for the models. Um, Behind the scenes, the, the Global Mango Watch project is divided in, I think, a little over 100 different regions that have regionalized uh, models. And each of the re those regions, you know, for some, we have great training data already, and for others, not so great. Um, so the more we have, the, the better the data eventually will, uh, will become. Um, you can contact us at uh, contact at Mangrove Alliance for now, uh, mangrovealliance.org, I should say. Uh, the website's also listed, or this email address is also listed on the uh, globalmangrovewatch.org website. Great, thank you. So just looking through here, um, this might be a bit specific to Pete. Uh, what layer uh, 
parameter is updated in real time. And then it's asking about the um, algorithm that is used to classify um, mangroves and um, what accuracy assessment do you use when you do classify it as a mangrove? Okay, so in terms of what's updated in like, near real time, that's the change alerts layer um, that, that you were shown. Uh, and as I said in my presentation, that is a, not global at the moment. It's in process for Africa and what's currently on the portal is for a, a few uh, Pacific countries. Um, in terms of the uh, accuracy, I did quote accuracies in my presentation. I think the baseline is around 94% in terms of the uh, globally um, and the change is about 75% accuracy. And these are done uh, at the moment uh, through, uh, well, us looking at higher resolution imagery um, with, uh, with randomized points. Um, and I think just to go back to the previous question, any data that people can provide um, is really, really helpful because you guys are the experts of, <laughs> and know, your, know the areas of, uh, of your mangroves well. Uh, sitting here in mid Wales, uh, we have no mangroves. Um, so, uh, so we really do rely on uh, kind of interpreting kind of satellite imagery, um, but also kind of areas of the world that, that we happen to have visited and know, um, or areas that, that others that we know um, have, have visited. So yeah, the, the bigger that pool can be, the better. Great, and this is just a logistics question, probably for Lambert. It's just asking, um, what is the way that you can download this data and use it um, from your own home computer? Or um, can you embed this on a website? Yeah, um, for now we're primarily, uh, currently it's not possible yet, I should say. You can download all the, uh, the data, the um, global annual mangrove extent um, from, uh, United Nations Environment Programs World Conservation Monitoring Center, uh, Ocean Data Viewer. Uh, this question was asked a number of times. And so um, the, the direct link to the data set uh, has been included in the answers. Um, we're working on making the change alerts, uh, so the, the points, the near real time change alerts, on making that available uh, via an API. So you can directly connect to it uh, via your own desktop GIS system. For the longer term future, we'd like to have all layers available that way, but it's going to depend a bit on the number of users, the costs, et cetera. But the, the direct use case for the change alerts, uh, I think will add a lot of value uh, to users. Thank you, Lamert. Um, I'm going to send this one to Peter, um, and maybe then Chris, if you have follow up for it, is really thinking about how do we translate this? So we, you see this global mangrove watch, it's very technical. How do we then use this for uptake for policymakers and politicians who may not understand the science that's on this platform, but um, need this information? So how do you, you see us translating that? Yeah, thanks, Emily. We have a bit of a a two-pronged strategy for this. So on one hand, we hope that policymakers, practitioners will find their way to the platform themselves um, and uh, play with the data layers, look at the widgets and get the answers they need and then integrate it in their daily work. But you're right in saying, of course, that the people who will be doing this are already kind of mangrove allies. They have a keen interest. They make the effort to go to this website. But we want to reach out to a much larger group of people who might not be working with mangroves on a day to day basis, but where we think that this information might help to convince them to take mangroves more seriously. So we really want to raise the profile of mangroves with this wider group of people from businesses, uh, people who work with all kinds of government ministries, for example, on sustainable development, coastal zone management, climate change. And the way in which we want to re uh, reach those people is that uh, rather than them necessarily going to this website, we want to take the infographics, the beautiful maps, the little tables that are generated by our platform and kind of make a proactive effort to reach out with that information to them. And because the Mangrove Watch platform provides very visual information, we think with those very nice graphics, we can make a very convincing uh, case. On top of that, what we also want to do is to proactively reach out to that group 
by telling the stories that come up through the platform. So for example, if we see in a certain country that there is a sudden loss of mangroves or that there is a particular value of mangroves, our thinking is that we want to create all kinds of blog stories, little videos, uh, news uh, articles, um, and proactively use that visual information to make our case. And that we will be doing partly through the Global Mangrove Alliance, this network of organizations that are working on mangroves already. So they will be using this information as a basis for their communications and policy work. But I do strongly believe that the success of this outreach also depends on a much bigger audience taking a role in, in doing this outreach. So I would be yeah, very keen to invite you uh, to look at the work that you are doing with other stakeholders and how you can uh, take a role in, uh, in doing this outreach with us. Uh, so in a way, this session is also very much an invite to you uh, to partner in this effort, to become a contributor either of scientific data or as a communicator or a policy informer and work with us in this effort. And yeah, if you would be keen to explore with us what that would look like, please get in touch with us. And yeah, then we can explore together how Mangrove Watch can serve your current work. Thanks, Peter. So we're um, actually at time. Uh, we have had over 55, I think about 60 questions right now. So I apologize if we didn't get to everyone. So again, please look at the resources in the chat of ways that you can connect with us. As Peter said, we need your feedback. Um, so please send it our way. We are now going to take a 30 minute break um, and then we will regroup for session two. Uh, that will be looking more around remote sensing and um, really excited to have you guys join the second session. Thank you so much for participating in this one. Uh, your feedback was very valuable. Have a lovely day. Thank you.
I think we are we are on. Welcome everybody for the second session. Um, we just had a great um, first session for this event. My name is Octavia Burto. I am associate professor at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and it is a pleasure to be to be here with all the panelists and all the people that will tell us um, many, many important things about mangroves. I just want to um, give a very brief introduction. I think we are in a moment of um, um, a great moment, the next decade. It's a very, very important decade to achieve conservation goals for, for this planet, for many ecosystems. And one of them, or probably one of the most important of them are mangrove uh, ecosystems. So increased spatial and temporal resolution of data capture would represent a greater opportunity to further enhance our understanding of the status and trends in marine habitats and ecosystems, the drivers of change and the impacts of degradation on their contribution to people. This will also improve visualization and maps to support the decision-making uh, process. Effective management requires governments to know where, what, why, and how much of an activity is sustainable as anthropogenic impacts expand further offshore. By accomplish this goal, increasing our technology for mapping, uh, there will be numerous additional benefits beyond increasing our understanding of the planet, uh, including improved management plans, technological advances, training of new generations of scientists from diverse backgrounds and increased collaborations between stakeholders. So for that reason, um, I think this webinar, it's very, very important um, and I hope you enjoy all these presentations. So uh, let's start with our first uh, panelist. Um, we will um, start with Steve Shield from the Nature Conservancy, Drones in the Caribbean. And uh, Steve. The all right, can you hear me? Am I coming across? Okay, let's start this up. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about some of the projects that we're doing in the in the Caribbean. My name is Steve Schill. I'm the lead scientist for the Caribbean. And uh, hopefully you can see this. So let's uh, start with a few uh, few maps here. And this shows you some of the mapping projects that we've done uh, in the Caribbean over the past uh, 10 years. And most of these have been coral focused, but we've also been working on mangrove restoration. And you can see the numbers here, uh, just over half a million mangroves have been planted in some of these sites. Uh, we work in uh, seven offices across the Caribbean. I'm gonna focus on the insular Caribbean. We're working in 17 countries and territories, and we focus on uh, ocean management, uh, coral protection, working on mangrove restoration, and also climate change adaptation. And specifically, we'll, we work a lot with identifying sites uh, where we can use nature-based solutions to help protect coastal communities. So some of the things that we've been working on include uh, high resolution uh, mapping of mangroves and we're using drones uh, for a lot of that as well as high resolution image data data maps uh, such as you know Google Earth and uh, Bing imagery. And this is really important for picking up the smaller fringing mangroves which are characteristic of these uh, small island uh, systems. Uh, we're, we're spending a lot of time with partners working on mangrove biophysical indicators uh, and developing health indices. Uh, we've carried out a number of drone uh, training exercises with government agencies and other partners. Uh, we've mapped quite a few uh, mangrove patches in many of the Eastern Caribbean states, uh, which are critical for inventory 
the inventory of these systems. And then uh, we've also been working on identifying optimal sites, like I mentioned, for nature-based solutions and for the blue carbon work that we're, we're starting to, to do. And finally, we've been doing a lot of work with uh, cloud computing using, using Google Earth Engine to estimate mangrove change over time, taking advantage of these uh, high resolution data sets that we've been developing. So here's an example of some of the mapping products. Uh, we've mapped over uh, just over 900,000 hectare. And when we overlay the, the managed area database that we have, there's about 59% that are included within, within these uh, managed area polygons. Now, not all of these are being actively managed. There's, there's many times in governments when uh, uh, hotel proposals come in and, and then mangroves are removed. So, so continually uh, educating uh, the stakeholders and working with them to understand the importance of these mangroves and the value that they contribute um, is something that uh, is, a, is a primary objective of our work. Here you can see some examples, some of the detail uh, from our mangrove database. And these data, data sets are available for download at our uh, Caribbean Atlas uh, page, which, which uh, I'll, be, I'll provide on the, on the chat. Um, here's an example showing uh, how some of those, those small, narrow, fringing mangrove patches are often excluded in some of these global data sets because they're they're very they're very narrow. Um, sometimes they can be less than five meters across, but but they're very important for connectivity in these local local systems. Uh, we've done a lot of work. I'm going to show you uh, some examples, some case studies. Here's an example in Baja Yuna in Dominican Republic in the Samana Bay, one of the largest uh, mangrove forests there where we've done a number of projects uh, working with partners to inventory uh, biophysical characteristics such as the diameter breast height and modeling that with mangrove biomass uh, from remotely sensed uh, products. Uh, in this area, we've seen a loss of about 233 hectare of mangrove since 2003. But at the same time, we've seen growth of mangroves over 200 hectare uh, around the mouth of the river. So here's an example showing uh, some uh, the area where mangrove loss has occurred in the north uh, with a lot of aquaculture activities, as you can see here. But as we look in the south, we can see over the past 14 years uh, the gradual extent of, of the mangroves uh, because of the sedimentation that the river uh, delivers and the mangroves continue to creep out into the bay. Uh, we've done quite a bit with drone mapping uh, since 2014 throughout the Caribbean. As I mentioned, uh, this is the system we started with. It's a modified Sony QX1 that we converted to uh, near infrared, uh, which enabled us to do a lot more uh, vegetation mapping and understanding the dynamics of these systems. Uh, this is a very large sensor and it gives us really good imagery. Um, and uh, here's some examples showing, uh, this is in Salt River, Jamaica, uh, near the Portland Bight, uh, where a causeway has caused a large area of mangroves to die off. And, and we use drones to monitor these systems and look at changes and how we can, we can uh, reintroduce the flow needed to restore these, these systems. This is an example in, in Tyrell Bay, Grenada, where they've undergone a uh, marine expansion project, and we're monitoring the effects that this is having on, on mangrove systems. And, and drones are really a great way to, to be able to do that on a regular basis and, and get the resolution that you need to, to look at the impacts that this is having on, on mangrove systems. And another example uh, I want to end with is Ashton Lagoon that we've been monitoring. This is in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And this was a marina construction uh, in the 90s that was uh, abandoned. And a lot of the flow to this mangrove, which is the largest mangrove patch for St. Vincent and the Grenadines, was cut off. And we, we saw a lot of die off in the central part of the mangroves. And so we've been mapping this over time. Here you can see some of the products. 
showing those, those finger piers that were built, uh, the natural color and the infrared uh, products, and then the digital surface models, which allow us insight into the, the biomass and the, the structure of, of the mangroves. And this is all at a two to four centimeter uh, resolution. So we've been able to map uh, the reduction of these mangroves, the increase, you can see the, in the increase along the, the finger piers there. And uh, a lot of work has been done to try to, try to restore. Uh, we've worked with local partners to uh, plant, uh, replant mangroves in that central area. And also they've been doing work on reestablishing re the natural flow to the lagoon and putting in uh, cuts to the, these original finger piers that were built. And you can see the difference that that makes uh, in, in the water quality. And finally, the work we've been doing with Google Earth Engine, uh, looking at NDVI change, we've been using the polygons from our high resolution mangrove data sets to look at change over time using Landsat 8 since 2013. And here's some examples showing uh, a, crew, a cruise ship that was built in, uh, in Maimon, uh, Dominican Republic. And you can see in the red, the, the loss of vegetation there and that can be summarized in our in our uh, shape files um, we can look at uh, NDVI change and look at the developed thresholds to indicate loss and and all, all these are available on our on our, our site uh, the Caribbean Atlas uh, site for the TNC team and then here's an example in Makote in St. Lucia where we've uh, done a lot of mangrove restoration work uh, working with partners. Uh, there's been some die-off in this area and, and we've uh, carried out a number of restoration projects with partners there. And you can see the, the change in the biomass and the growth of, of mangroves over, over this uh, five-year period. So that's a quick roundup of the work that we've done. And uh, I'm going to turn it back to you, Octavio. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, Actually, I forget to mention that we will have some polls during the presentation. So please um, um, stay with us and participate in these polls. And uh, after all the presentations, we will have um, a panel, a discussion panel with all our speakers. So uh, next in the list is um, Astrid Chu from the Scripps Institution of Oceanography drones and machine learning for local monitoring. Astrid. Great, hello everyone. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen. All right, and you guys can all see that, yes? Um, yes. Great, so Hi everyone, my name is Astrid Su. I'm a researcher at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Today I'll be talking about drones and machine learning, um, especially for local monitoring. And this is work done in collaboration with Engineers for Exploration and Central para la Biodiversidad Marina y la Conservación. All right, when it comes to mangroves, Mexico has quite the coverage and diversity of them. From the two meter shrubby desert mangroves of Baja to the 40 meter giants in the forest of La Encrucijada, Mexico is fifth in the world for the country with the most mangroves. In fact, Mexico has an agency, CONABIO, or the Commission of Biodiversity, that conducts a mangrove inventory once every five years. In 2015, CONABIO reported a total coverage of 775,000 hectares of mangroves for all of Mexico. In 2019, we also held a workshop on drones for environmental monitoring with four Mexican agencies, CONAMP, the National Commission of Natural Protected Areas, CONAGUA, the National Commission of Water, INEHI, the National Institute of Statistics and Geography, and CERETU, the Secretariat of um, Agrarian Land and Urban Development. And we asked them, what are your main goals when it comes to monitoring and managing wetlands? Currently, their priority is to update wetland maps, specifically increase the resolution of their maps from 1 in 150,000 units to 1 in 50,000 units, essentially increase it by three times. Furthermore, they're looking to de 
define fine details of their habitats to help inform management decision making. But these four agencies, currently they've been relying on the maps that Conabio publishes, the ones that I mentioned early in this talk. And what these maps rely on are satellite imagery. This is what their satellite imagery looks like. Um, satellites are great. <laughs> They're able to cover uh, the entire globe, let alone all of Mexico. So very fantastic in being able to image a large area. However, satellites tend to be relatively coarse. This is an example of Sentinel with a resolution of 10 meters per pixel. And so you can see, it's a little bit hard to distinguish what it is, at least optically, especially if you need more detail for a local region. For the last couple of years, we've been going around Mexico and imaging mangrove forests. And we're able to get much sharper imagery thanks to drones, similar to what Steve mentioned. Our resolution is about three centimeters per pixel. And whether or not you have satellite imagery or drone imagery, in order to make this imagery meaningful, they need to be labeled. And with higher resolution imagery, you also need more detailed labels. So here's an example of a drone imagery that we have and what it looks like labeled. Um, traditionally, this is done manually, so by hand, sitting there drawing polygons. And this can take anywhere from 300 to 400 hours to label one kilometer squared. It's incredibly labor and time intensive. So we're looking to see, okay, well, how can we expedite this? And we've turned to machine learning, specifically deep learning. We've been using convolutional neural networks or CNNs, which are really powerful because they're able to take limited training data and produce highly accurate label. Essentially, it takes our hand labels, tileizes them, essentially make them into a tile, and then classifies the resulting tile. Um, it, it does this by extracting image features to produce these labels. And here's a progression of our algorithms from left to right. Left is uh, the oldest one, right is the newest one. And as you go through this progression, each edition, you can see that we've been able to increase not only our accuracy, but our precision of these models. And this is possible because we leaned on transfer learning to get more accurate models with less data. However, CNNs have one weakness, and it's in the fact that they use tiles, right? These tiles essentially perform worse on less contiguous areas of a mangrove forest. So what does that mean? When you are looking at this drone imagery in which we're labeling, this fine detail of hand labels are essentially lost in CNNs. Instead, it becomes covered with rectangles. And so we want to maintain that fine detail. And so we're now employing UNET uh, for classification, which is great because it builds upon the feature extractions of CNNs. But instead of outputting a tile classification, its output is pixel classifications. So we're able to maintain that fine detailed classification. So here's an example of these two algorithms um, compared. The CNN is the light green, so you can see it's quite boxy, it's overestimating in some areas, ignoring others. On the other hand, the unit is the dirt green mangrove. Um, and you can see it's really capturing the small tufts and islands of mangroves. This is especially important because if you're looking at monitoring a restoration area, where maybe you've planted saplings and mo are monitoring its growth or the failures, um, or maybe you're also looking at a mangrove stand that is highly sensitive and it's facing a lot of mangrove loss. In both of these scenarios, your mangrove stand is actually highly fragmented. So it's especially important that we're preserving this high detail and having a robust monitoring system so that we can stage interventions as needed. So from our tools that we've built um, from the machine learning, we're now expanding access and we're currently developing an assistive labeling application. This is, uh, will be available for users to download. Um, they can upload their own orthomosaic uh, image that they would like to label and it, this can be done offline. As they're labeling their image through this application, smart suggestions, which are powered by AI, will automatically uh, pop up. And essentially, this is a mechanism to enable faster labeling of high resolution imagery. Likewise, we're also currently developing an image classification portal. 
And because deep learning models aren't necessarily the easiest thing for ecologists or other stakeholders to use, um, and especially because this entire classification scheme requires strong computing power, this portal enables users to upload their image. Um, it'll be computed, processed on our end using Microsoft Azure, and then labels, um, these classifications, will be, then be made available for end users to download, and then they can proceed on with their own analyses. Both of these two access options will be available in early fall. So combine our machine learning and as well as our different access options together, they'll really uh, provide an opportunity for others to expedite labeling by harnessing the power of machine learning. Additionally, with drones, we can produce higher resolution maps. And furthermore, we won't have to wait five years for the next update of the map. Rather, we can produce these maps annually, monthly, and as needed. Ultimately, we are looking to equip resource managers and decision makers with the data that they need to take sustainable decisions. We're looking to support them in gathering data through drones, as well as labeling their imagery that they uh, come up with. Essentially, the tools that we are building are designed to be flexible to fit the different needs, capabilities, and capacities of different stakeholders. Um, thank you so much for tuning in. I'd like to acknowledge our funders. You can contact me at my email or on Twitter. And then if we have time, I yield the rest of the time to questions. Well, I think um, the audience is uh, putting their questions in the, in the box of the Q&A. And maybe we can bring all these questions. We will answer some of them during the these presentations, but uh, probably in the in the panel discussion discussion panel, we will address all of all of them. So uh, let's um, continue with the next presentation. So Nathan Thomas and Pete Bontin from NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, we will hear about um, Global Mangrove Watch. Hi, uh, thanks, Octavia. Uh, share my screen. Uh, give me a moment. Uh, share. Um, share. Okay, I guess is that the right one, or is it a different screen? Do I need to it's a different screen? Uh, switch to this one. Perfect. There we go. Okay, great. <clears throat> um, so thanks for the introduction. Um, I'm Nathan. I'm a postdoc um, at the University of Maryland postdoc at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Um, I would just like to give you of some of the science behind the Golden Mangrove Watch. I know that uh, Pete Pending has given um, an overview of some of the products already, uh, but I thought I would take a, a little step back for those who are less familiar with um, some of the remote sensing processes, uh, give more of an introductory um, level talk on some of the data sets that we use and the way that we process data to make the uh, global scale maps. Um, so first of all, as you know, we have this uh, global scale uh, map of mangrove extent, um, which is based um, on the year uh, 2010. Um, so how do we go about making this map? So uh, first of all, we decide to um, define uh, what we think is a reasonable mangrove habitat. So we know that mangroves don't exist in very high latitudes um, or at very high elevations. Um, so we have this two-step approach, firstly, um, that defines this initial mangrove habitat. And this is basically, as I said, is targeting areas where we expect mangroves to be. Um, and this is based on some of the existing mangrove maps that exist. So we pull statistics from their locations, and that helps us, uh, helps inform us of where these uh, locations are. Um, we do this based on elevation and distance to coastal water. So in elevation, we use the SRTM uh, global elevation data set. Um, and we basically just use this to exclude um, any areas that are above low-lying um, regions where we know mangroves grow, so in tidal areas, for instance. Um, and then again, uh, we create this coastal water mask um, and then use thresholds um, on the distance of mangroves to that coastal water. Um, mangroves do obviously grow in, in freshwater environments, but um, the vast majority are at the coast. Um, so if uh, we're not expecting to find mangroves, sort of many hundreds of kilometers um, inland somewhere. So to uh, 
remove some of the uh, confusion around this, uh, we also use this uh, distance to coastal water mass. Um, in terms of the data sets we use, uh, we have uh, two main types. We have radar data and optical data. For the radar data, we use uh, Japanese Space Agency ALOS Palsar data. Um, and in total, I think there's around 1,500 ALOS Palsar images we use to create the GMW baseline map. And there's around 21 million pixels per band. Um, we use two bands for this sensor, so that's 42 million pixels um, in total. Uh, for the optical data, we use a blend of both Landsat 5 and Landsat 7. Uh, as you know, the uh, tropics um, has a problem with cloud cover, so we can't always guarantee to get um, good imagery. So we have to blend um, a couple of satellites to get the best coverage. Um, in total, there was 15,000 uh, Landsat images were used across 1,800 scenes. So it took 15,000 images in total to make 1,800 um, composites. And there are 55 million pixels per band. So this just gives you an idea of the um, data volumes uh, that go into a project of this size. So I want to talk about the radar uh, imagery a little bit more. Um, so radar is sensitive to a number of uh, physical properties of land cover types and vegetation. Um, so predominantly water content, size, uh, surface roughness, and that is in uh, relation to the wavelength. So how big your target is and compared to how big your wavelength is, and also the orientation of that target. Um, if you look at that diagram, you can see the numerous ways in which uh, radar is scattered from uh, various targets. So uh, at the canopy, we have something called volumetric scattering. Um, so uh, this causes the radar to come in in one direction and scatter in many different directions. Uh, we have specular scattering, which usually occurs off a water surface. Um, as radars tend to be uh, side looking, if you have a, a flat uh, surface, like a water surface, uh, incoming radar energy will, will bounce off it and away from the sensor, so you get little return there. Um, and then within um, flooded forests, which are quite unique to mangrove environments, we have what's known as this double bounce scattering mechanism. And this occurs when the radar uh, interacts with um, maybe the trunk of a mangrove forest and then bounces off into the water or vice versa. Um, and this causes sort of a prism effect where the, uh, the radar uh, signal comes back to the um, directly back to the sensor. So it looks like it's been enhanced basically because so much energy um, is coming back towards the sensor. Um, we have two what's known as polarizations and this is the orientation of the electric wave um, of, the, of the signal. We have copole, which basically means that um, the polarization uh, is the same going out as it is coming back in. In this case, it's horizontally uh, transmitted and horizontally received. And this is quite sensitive to these vertical trunks uh, physical targets such as trunks and this double bound scattering mechanism you see. And we also have a cross pole, and this is when the energy is submitted horizontally, but then it's received vertically. Um, what causes this to change is every time the radar interacts with a surface, it can change orientation. And um, when you have volumetric scattering, like a canopy, which is a very complex target with lots of branches in lots of different directions, this basically causes the uh, electric plane of the, of the wave to uh, orientate from horizontal to vertical. So using these two different bands, we can uh, differentiate different properties of a target. Um, just to give you an idea, this is what radar image looks like. Um, these are the mangroves at Parak, uh, Malaysia. And you can see um, the sort of relatively subtle difference. Um, but you can see that the darker mangroves compared to the lighter um, non-vegetated uh, and, and urban environments around it. Moving on to the optical imagery, uh, Landsat data is sensitive to uh, biophysical properties of vegetation, uh, particularly photosynthetic veg and then water content. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with this, um, if you look at the diagram there, you can see how different wavelengths reflect um, from a uh, plant differently. So uh, the red and the green, uh, sorry, the red and the blue are uh, susceptible to chlorophyll absorption. Um, but then in the near infrared, you have a strong reflectance. Uh, due to the spongy mesophyll in the uh, plant leaf structure. And then further on the wavelength, um, down near the short wave infrared spectrum or portion of the spectrum, we have water absorption features. Um, and this can tell us how much water content is in a uh, line cover type or a target. And the real benefit of this is that um, each, of, each type of vegetation reflects these wavelengths slightly differently. Um, so this is just an example from the visible to the near infrared. Um, just how different species are uh, absorb and reflect light differently because of 
the uh, chemical and physical properties. So we have a differentiation or variation um, between species in the light that they use and both reflect. Um, and to give you an idea of just what this what mangroves look like, this again is the mangroves of Parak in Malaysia. Um, and you can see that mangroves really jump out there. Um, this is a false color image, um, but it shows uh, how the red shape is both photosynthetic and then very wet. So the deeper orange color is um, because there's a lot more water in this environment than there is in the sort of more yellowy, drier uh, land covers around it. So we have all these images. So we break up the world into 128 different projects. Um, and then for each one of these, we follow uh, the following workflow. So as I mentioned, we have this coastal mask and this uh, mangrove habitat layer that we begin with. Uh, then we uh, generate training data. And training data basically uh, is a way for us to tell a algorithm or a machine what mangroves look like. And for this, we use 12.8 million training samples globally. We then use two, uh, a two-step approach to classification. So we have uh, mangrove baseline A, which uses machine learning algorithms um, using the radar data. And then we have mangrove baseline B, which within that area, um, within mangrove baseline A, we reclassify using the Landsat data. And this um, tries to get the machine and now it knows what mangroves look like to try and recognize an unknown pixel that we feed it. Um, and then a machine is then able to decide um, and say this un un unknown pixel is a mangrove um, or whatnot. Um, and then we can use uh, local scale da data and earth and uh, imagery to go on, or Google Earth and imagery to go and validate this. Um, and then we end up with our global mangrove baseline. Um, I do want to touch briefly upon some of the changes also that we create. Um, I know that Pete spoke about this um, in some detail, but we know that mangroves are driven, uh, mangrove change is driven by natural and human causes. Um, so does that mean we have to make a new global map every year? Um, but obviously, uh, given the volume of data, that's a very labor intensive uh, and very machine intensive process. So instead we detect changes that are existing in our current baseline. Um, and you can see from that plot there that the uh, uh, backscatter from mangroves and water is, is very different, very distinct. So by taking a mask of our existing mangrove baseline, um, looking at the statistics of that, we can then look into certain regions of the statistical distribution, such as the tails. Um, and then we can begin to um, slice away at that tail and do some normality testing um, to let the machine automatically detect where the best threshold is. Uh, when we find that iteration and uh, apply that threshold, those are then the change features um, that we can apply to our baseline. And then we can do that every year. So rather than having to create a new baseline every year, we can just update with changes instead. Um, and that's what the image, uh, that's what the algorithm does. And you can see the red and the blue areas are the gain and loss areas respectively. Um, and I'll leave you there. Uh, thank you very much for um, all those listed there. And I will take um, any questions. Uh, thank you, Octavio. Thank you, Nathan. Um... Well, I think we are getting um, several questions. I will uh, probably ask them to you during the discussion panel. Um, let's um, let's move forward with Lola Fatoimbo from NASA as well, and remote sensing of mangrove biomass and loss drivers. Lola. Yes. Um. One second. I'm working to share my screen. Oh, I, I'm going to log right back in to share my screen. Sorry. Okay. Maybe Astrid, is this a good time to have a, one of the polls? Yes, let's go ahead and do that. So let me launch one, here we go.
Here I am. Can you see my screen? Yes, Lola, we're just having a poll. Then maybe a couple more seconds. Sounds good. Great. All right. Great. All right, Lola, take it away. Sounds good. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Lola Fatuyungo, and I'm a research scientist at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. So today I'll be talking about some of our efforts on remote sensing on mangrove biomass and lost drivers. So um, as I mentioned today, I'll be talking about some of uh, the data products that we've been working on, in particular, two global data products that are relatively new in their availability. The first one is the global three-dimensional map of mangrove structure. And what I mean by mangrove structure is uh, mangrove canopy height and biomass um, and carbon stocks that we can then derive from those. And then also a new map of the, all the drivers of mangrove loss globally, and this is at 30 meter resolution. And we've developed these maps for a whole number of applications, ranging from applications for biomass and carbon cycle studies, um, studies of ecosystem condition and function in mangroves, uh, to get a better understanding of all the ecosystem services of mangroves, and finally, how we could better manage and restore them. So there is now a whole range of three-dimensional products that are available that we can and have been using to monitor mangrove structure. Um, I'm showing here a few of the new um, and Did we lose Lola? I think we have a problem with uh, Lola. Um, let's see if we can connect with, with her, Astrid. Yeah, we lost her. But uh, we hope that uh, she will connect soon. Maybe it's time for the next poll. <laughs> that is the reason why you need to have polls. So, uh, Octavio, uh, Lola is having some technical problems um, with yes. her machine. She'll be um, back with us um, as soon as possible. She'll just have to restart her laptop. Fantastic. Octavio, maybe we can uh, we can have a question too. If there's a nice question in the uh, um, that there, I think that Astrid and uh, um, also Nathan could could answer. Um, basically, it's it's talking about. Um, what can you infer from the data? So what can you infer from drone data? What ecological characteristics can you infer from satellite data? Um, and specifically, the, the question was ask, asking about the drone. So can you do mangrove height biomass species from, from the drone data, data Astrid? And then maybe uh, maybe Nathan, you can follow up with sort of what, what do you think you can infer from uh, currently from satellite data? Absolutely, yeah. So for the drone data, we certainly can uh, produce these 3D models in which we're able to look at biomass, canopy height, things of that nature. Um, we are working on specific projects to uh, produce those calculations. Um, on the biodiversity end, looking at our imagery, because we're able to get such high resolution imagery, we are able in 
certain areas, at least, uh, to look at mangrove species and uh, be able to actually kind of look at the difference between the two based on their structural uh, characteristics. So specifically, depending on the altitude that you're flying at, um, color, leaf shape, things of that nature. Yes, I think um, what Ashley mentioned there um, is great. I think uh, it's very well suited to the, the very high resolution data set. Uh, with the sort of satellites uh, that we use, obviously our resolution is much lower um, and picking apart some of these detailed analysis can be much more difficult. Um, that's not to say that it can't be done. Um, the way in which we use the satellite data for the GNW map is very focused towards uh, land cover mapping. So really looking at uh, mangrove extent rather than necessarily looking at uh, kind of biophysical or ecological um, attributes. Um, to do so would probably require um, additional remote sensing data, satellite data. Um, we can use the radar slightly differently, maybe use the uh, optical data, um, maybe use other optical data that has a higher spectral um, resolution to pick out uh, other biophysical properties. Um, but the data we have can be used um, in some sense for uh, proxies for certain um, ecological um, factors. So maybe looking um, particularly at um, like the leaf area index um, and particularly changes through time. Um, I'm looking at uh, changes in water content. Um, they can begin to pick out proxies, but really our, our satellite based based data is really focused towards uh, land cover and extent mapping at this point. Thank Lola, you. you are back. Yes, I'm back. Apologies, my computer had a technical issue, but I'm back and I can jump right in. Yes, and just to mention that my colleague from UCSD, Ryan Kastner, <laughs> will continue helping us here. Um, he will lead the discussion session, but uh, yes, Lola, please. <laughs> Okay, so as I mentioned in the slide previously, we have a whole suite of new data sets available um, that are used to estimate um, uh, above ground that we can use to estimate 3D structure in, in forest and particularly in mangroves. Here I'm going to focus on two data sets um, that we've been using. One is from the shuttle radar topography mission, the SRTM DEM. Um, it's often used um, all over the world to estimate topography, but actually it turns out that it works really well to measure canopy height in mangrove forests. Now, as Nathan mentioned in his talk before, when we're working with radar data, um, we have to make some adjustments to the data sets. In this case, when we're working with a canopy height data in particular, we have to calibrate the data so that it actually measures what we're trying to see so that we can actually compare it with, what, with the types of measurements that we get either from um, an airborne instrument or maybe a drone, drone um, canopy height model, or in this case with in situ measurements. Um, so we've been working with an instrument called ISAT. This is the, the world's first spaceborne LIDAR instrument. And the advantage of LIDAR is that it's very accurate. So we get very accurate measurements of canopy height, but you only have samples. So you don't have wall-to-wall -wall imaging. Whereas with a LIDAR, with the radar data set, such as the SRTM or Shuttle Radar Topography Mission data set, we get wall-to-wall um, -wall coverage, but the accuracy is not as as good as we would um, as we would expect from a, from LIDAR or field measurements. So what we do by combining the two data sets, which is this this um, plot that you're seeing on the left, where we're comparing ISET two relative height and SRTM height, is to uh, derive a calibration model so that we can get at the height measurement that compares the best with what we see in the field or on the ground. We also have to do the same with our biomass map. So if once we have a canopy height map, we can then use that to actually derive biomass because there's an allometric relationship um, between the height of the tree and its biomass. Um, to do that, we have to do extensive field campaigns, which is what I'm showing here on the right, some cheerful people from a field campaign that we had in Central Africa. And what we then work on is deriving a biomass um, calibration model to get from height to biomass. Um, and we do this on a global scale. So here is a, the map of global canopy height that I'm showing. Because mangroves are only such a small band or, uh, on the coast, uh, it looks a little bit coarser here than it actually is. These maps are actually at 30 meter resolutions globally. 
And what you're seeing here, the numbers is all of the sites where we've collected field measurements. Um, so what are our main results? Um, we found that there is a huge range in canopy height in mangroves. They range up to 63 meters is the tallest mangrove that we found. Um, these are stands that are both in Gabon and in Colombia. And so we were also really interested in better understanding, you know, what are the main drivers between uh, the main drivers that lead to these really tall trees or to this large range in canopy height that we see across the world. Because in reality, most trees are actually not, most mangrove trees are not 65 meters tall. Globally, the average is about 13 meters. And so when we, when we compared our mangrove height and tried to relate it to some global environmental drivers that we had, we found that um, uh, precipitation, so the amount of fresh water that mangroves get, the mean temperature, and then also the frequency of cyclones were the best predictors of mangrove height. And it also, because height is directly related to biomass, also of mangrove biomass. So in this plot at the bottom left, what you're seeing is the relationship between latitude, above ground biomass, and tropical cyclone frequency. And what you'll see is that in those, um, in those central regions, those, those low latitudes where you have high, high um, temperatures, high rainfall, and low cyclone frequency, this is where you have the highest biomass globally. We also have, um, we've also generated uh, estimates of total of, uh, per country estimates for all of these va va values, whether it's height or biomass or carbon stores. Um, and you could find these in this paper that was published by Samard and all last year. But really the take home message here is that Indonesia really dominates the global biomass and carbon stocks, um, followed by the uh, following five countries that have the largest area in biomass in, in, in mangrove cover. So um, if interested, you can go and download this data set. It's available for free. If you're not uh, an expert in remote sensing or really what you're mostly interested in is visualizing the data and having the per country statistics, we've also developed an app which, for which you have the, the link here that you can go to and you can visualize the data. You can either visualize the canopy height map, the carbon stocks or the above ground biomass as published in the paper. Um, now, in a second, I would like to talk to you about a new data set that has just been published last week, which is the global mangrove loss drivers. So here I'm showing you an example of mangrove loss that happened in 2017. On the left, you're seeing an image of the Florida Everglade mangroves um, before Hurricane Irma hit, and hit this area. And on the right, you're seeing what it looks like after the destruction of a very powerful storm. So to generate a global map of the lost drivers, we had to take a, a series of steps. The first one being that we needed to know exactly where the loss was happening. So we needed a baseline loss extent map. We did this by, um, by looking at the entire archive of Landsat 5, 7, and 8 imagery. And we generated an NDVI anomaly. So we looked at the areas where you have the normalized differentiated vegetation index where those areas where the NDVI changed over time when you compare it to a baseline reference period from 1998 to 2001. And when comparing this, these areas, we were able to detect those regions where there were mangroves before and that had been lost between 2000 and 2016. We then used a um, random forest algorithm. This is a type of machine learning algorithm to essentially do a land cover change classification that separated the areas where there had been loss into three main categories. Those categories were bare soil, water, and wet soil. And by separating these, um, the, the losses into these three categories, that, that then gave us a better idea of what type of loss was actually happening in those regions. Was it being converted to something else or was it staying um, an open mangrove area or um, was it um, uh, not converted to, to would, would it regrow or not convert to something, to another land cover type? Um, so here's an example, two examples we have, one from Myanmar and one from Indonesia. And so here you see that this is, you know, really a 30 meter resolution, uh, detailed map of, of land cover changes. And this map 
Once we had then the map of, of land cover changes into those three categories, we then went through these land use change decision trees. I won't go through all the details of this tree because there's too many categories, but essentially we used a whole lot of um, decision mechanisms and ancillary data to decide whether um, the change that happened was separated into commodities. And when we say commodities, we mean um, either aquaculture or some type of agriculture, whether it was primarily due to erosion, whether it was non-productive conversion. So for example, cutting of mangroves, or if it was um, um, uh, extreme event driven. So here's an example from the Sundarbans in Bangladesh. Here we have primarily erosionally driven losses. And, what, and as you see here, we have these erosional bands. So we have separated it into three time periods, from uh, five year time periods. And you can really see how with the progression of time, because of erosion, most likely due to sea level rise, mangroves here were lost. Here's another example showing um, more of the coastal squeeze phenomenon where you have a combination of two types of loss drivers. From the seaward side, you have erosion. Um, and on the landward side, you have commodities. So this is a region where we have, where there is a lot of um, rice agriculture, for example. Um, here we have the global national loss driver trends. Essentially, each color here you're seeing is the primary driver for each country. You see that there is a big range in types of drivers. Um, but if we look at the bottom here, we have the per uh, continental breakdown of these main drivers. We find that in North America, the main, the main causes are due to extreme weather events and erosion um, in North and South America, both together. Um, in Africa, the primary driver is non-productive conversion. And, and in Asia here in G, the primary driver is due to commodities. Um, where then Oceania, again, it is a combination of erosion and extreme weather events. Now, we also started to look at this um, on a per time scale because one of the goals was to see if these drivers have changed over time. Has there been any, any change in the rate of loss and in the, in the type of loss that we're seeing on a global scale? And what we did find is that direct human-driven mangrove losses did decline. They declined by 73% from 2000 to 2016. Um, we also found that 62% of global losses from 2000 to 2016 resulted um, from human driven land use change. Um, but almost all of those changes that were human driven happened within six Southeast Asian countries. Um, but there's also a positive note to this story, which is that we found, you know, because, because there's a change in human driven losses, there is most likely um, effective conservation um, uh, outcomes that are happening um, and mangrove losses really are declining uh, rapidly. On the other hand, when you take out um, those six main countries where you have the commodities or human driven losses, what we're finding is that the contribution of uh, natural losses such as extreme events like hurricanes, uh, cyclones, um, and erosion are actually increasing over time. Um, we have a, an app where you can download all of this data, um, the mangrove loss drivers app, you can read the paper, you can download the data, and you can also visualize the data um, if you don't want to download it and process it on your own computer. Um, and with that, I'm, I would like to thank you. Thank you very much, Lola. and. Um... And we will move forward for the next presentation. And after that, probably we will have the last poll. Um, the next uh, presentation is Caleb Robinson uh, uh, from Microsoft Multi-Resolution Algorithms. Caleb. Hi, can you hear me and see my presentation? Um, we see your screen, not uh, the presentation. Uh, uh, let's try this. How about now? Now, now we see the presentation. Perfect. Awesome.
Oh, great. Um, so thanks, everyone. Uh, my name is Caleb Robinson. I'm a data scientist at uh, Microsoft's AI for Good Research Lab. Uh, and I'm going to talk today about multi-resolution algorithms for land cover mapping. This is work uh, done during my PhD uh, and that I'm continuing at AI for Good. Uh, so first, I just want to say thank you to all of the wonderful collaborators that have helped work on this with me. Um, so just thank you, everyone here. And start with what is the land cover mapping problem? So in land cover mapping, we're given high resolution satellite or aerial imagery. Um, in the imagery that I'm showing here, each uh, pixel in the image represents about a meter squared in real life. And our objective is to label each of these pixels as belonging to one of several different types of land cover classes. For example, here we have water, forest, field, and built up surfaces. And this land cover data is important for many different reasons. Uh, one of which is to inform conservation actions. Uh, so the example that I really like to give is this one of riparian buffer restorations. Uh, on the image over here on the left, you can see riparian buffers are these uh, vegetated areas that border streams and rivers and prevent harmful runoff from entering in the waterway. And land cover data can actually be used to find uh, areas in which these riparian buffers need to be fixed. So in this talk, I'm going to give uh, just one example of how we can train machine learning models to predict land cover uh, given uh, different types of uh, labels, specifically a mixture of high resolution and low resolution labels. Um, so we treat this problem as a semantic segmentation problem where our objective is to train a convolutional neural network to make high resolution predictions, we can see over here on the right, um, from given high resolution imagery. So we want to label, again, each pixel and the input as belonging to one of several different types of land cover classes, then use this trained model to uh, run inference over the entire area that we care about and get our land cover data. And the traditional way to train these models involves having a large labeled data set of pairs of high resolution imagery and high resolution ground truth labels. Um, and this works great if you do have access to these, you can uh, have your model make predictions or the training data set and then compare the model predictions uh, pixel by pixel with your ground truth data and use something like a cross entropy loss to update the parameters of the model. Um, but the problem is if we had access to this large labeled data set, our problem would be solved because that's the land cover data that we want, right? Uh, so in this setting, we're saying that we have access to high resolution labels, uh, but just from part of the area that we want to uh, make a land cover map of, uh, and low resolution labels everywhere else. So specifically, uh, in our setting, we have high resolution labels in the Chesapeake Bay watershed, which is this area in the northeastern US highlighted by uh, this blue outline, uh, and access to low resolution labels at a 30 meter spatial resolution everywhere else in the continental United States. And the problem is, can we integrate these to train a model that will work well over the entire United States? So just to go over the data again, uh, we have high resolution imagery. This is at a one meter spatial resolution and it's available nationally, specifically it's from the NAEP program. We have high resolution labels. Uh, these are, again are at a one meter resolution and just available in this Chesapeake Bay watershed in the Northeast US. Uh, and then low resolution labels at a 30 meter spatial resolution uh, available all across the US. And the work or in the solution that we proposed here is this super resolution loss. Uh, and the super resolution loss allows us to uh, use the same model training setup where we have high resolution imagery uh, and then labels and training a segmentation model. But now instead of having uh, every single or having a value for every single pixel, we have uh, values in these 30 meter by 30 meter blocks. And the problem is, can we use these to inform the parameter updates of the model? I'm just gonna very briefly go over how this uh, super resolution loss idea works. So we take advantage of the fact that we have uh, an area in which we have overlapping low resolution and high resolution labels. And this is exactly this Chesapeake Bay watershed area that I was talking about. And we can use this overlap to compute the joint distribution between uh, these two uh, different data sets. And I'm giving an example of what this looks like down here at the bottom, uh, where you have a table that gives for every low resolution class that we have the distribution over high resolution classes. And what this says is on average, a pixel that is labeled as developed open space uh, will contain 0% of water, 42% of forest, 
course, 46% of field, and so on. We can use this information to actually train our model. And how we do this is look at each 30 meter block in the model's predictions and the ground truth labels that we have, we're calling the low resolution of the ground truth, uh, and comparing these distributions. So for example, this pixel here, the developed open space pixel, we know from the table it should contain 0% water, 42% forest, and so on. And then we can count the uh, predictions made by our model over the same block. And we can find, for example, that we have predicted here 50% water and 20% forest, and so on. And what this gives us is two distributions of the same type of thing, counts of high resolution predictions, uh, an expected distribution from the low resolution data source and the predicted distribution from the model. And now that these are in the same format, we can compare the expected and predicted distributions with some differentiable distribution based measure, for example, KL divergence. Um, so our final training setup looks like this, where now we can use high resolution input imagery and high resolution ground truth labels uh, in order to train the model in areas in which we have access to those high resolution ground truth labels, and then high resolution imagery and low resolution ground truth labels everywhere else. Uh, so in our work, the final loss function that we use to train this convolutional neural network is just a weighted summation of these two loss functions. So to summarize this idea, our model is making predictions at a one meter resolution. We're summarizing these predictions up to a 30 meter resolution, the resolution of our uh, low res labels. Uh, and then we're comparing these summarized versions to the ground truth at a 30 meter resolution. And using this, we can train a network with both high and low resolution labels in a unified way. Uh, I'm not going to show re results for this because this is an eight minute talk, um, but we found that this improves the spatial generalization of these networks. So now our networks are making better land cover predictions in areas in which we only have access to the low resolution labels. And you can use this idea in other contexts. For example, if you want to predict land cover from Sentinel 2 imagery, which is a 10 meter spatial resolution, you can form these uh, model with, uh, for example, low resolution land cover labels generated from the MODIS satellites. The MODIS has an annual land cover product at a 500 meter resolution. These are very noisy, uh, but the idea still works. And this actually uh, example is taken from the IEEE's uh, GRSS data fusion competition uh, over the fall. Uh, we won one of the tracks in this competition, not with this super resolution loss idea, um, but with a different idea, but the, the same, same technique still applies. Uh, so combining low resolution labels with uh, limited high resolution labels is what the super resolution idea is all about. Uh, and that's all I have. If you uh, want more information about the work that we're doing on land cover mapping, you can go to this link. Uh, and thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Kalev. And um, I think, um, do we have a final poll? Or we already ask This is the final one. Perfect. So while you start answering the question, I will introduce our next and final panelist. So Sarah Prockner from UNEP, WCMC, Global Ocean Observing Systems. And she will, um, tell us about the mangrove monitoring in the context of the UN ocean decade. Let's wait a few seconds, Sarah, to finish the poll. And I think after uh, this presentation, my colleague Ryan Kastner will start helping us leading the discussion panel. Um, but this has been a uh, very, very interesting, a lot of very interesting presentations. And um, so let's start with you, Sarah. Thank you, Octavio. Thanks for all the really interesting presentations so far on the ins and outs of mangrove monitoring. And now as the final presentation, I just want to set it in the context of international agreements and the UN Ocean Decade. 
So mangroves really are at the heart of many different international agreements, as you can see here. And this is because they contribute lots to society, but also biodiversity, of course, and our fight against climate change. So while all of these agreements incorporate mangroves in some way, um, they are quite different from each other, but there are also synergies across. However, one of the difficulties that currently is faced by policymakers is the lack of agreement within the scientific community and the lack of statistics and simple data to measure progress towards these agreements. Fundamental statistics for use against these need to be agreed, but the data and statistics that feed into the indicators that are used to measure targets that are used to measure progress towards these agreements are often unclear and not harmonized. There are hundreds of long-term programs measuring data out there that could contribute to these, but they're often not globally coordinated and the metadata and raw data may often be hard to find. Data may not be openly accessible for policy and decision makers and programs may collect data in many different ways that are not standardized. Therefore, there's a need for coordination and collaboration to ensure that raw data can be translated to the knowledge and the indicators needed to address those reporting requirements. Collaboration and the Global Mangrove Watch, which we heard a lot about in the earlier presentations, which is a great project and very impressive. And these definitely are opportunities to generate consistent indicators and stats related to mangroves. And generating this core data will help produce indicators for many of these targets. Global Mangrove Watch is actually being proposed as an indicator for the post-2020 strategic agenda on the Convention on Biological Diversity. However, as I said earlier, member states are frustrated with the wide range of data and statistics out there. What they often want is a one-stop shop, so to speak, of data that is reliable and that can bring us a direct avenue from the data to the policy. Therefore, at the most recent United Nations Environment Assembly in 2019, the member states of the UN called for greater cooperation of mapping and evaluating of mangrove ecosystems. This resolution on the sustainable management for global health of mangroves is really leveraged for more studies, more national level approval, and the verification of maps and data sets. By working together, there's an opportunity to present a unified scientific voice regarding mangroves, which is something decision makers are really desperate for. In addition, there's a need to go beyond just the distribution of mangroves and just the extent of it and provide reliable evidence that can be used for indicators relating to the change and the implications for people and biodiversity. So all the presentations we heard about earlier and also the Global Mangrove Watch is a great opportunity to provide these additional data sets and additional information that go beyond the just the extent and really tell us the so what the blue carbon on climate change, the drivers of deforestation, what can we do? But anyway, there is a need for more detailed and localized information about the local context to really make these decisions on the ground and in the area and to see the so what of uh, mangroves for nature and people. Therefore, um, the Global Ocean Observing System has conducted, has looked into in situ programs, since they are important also for validating remotely sensed data sets um, to understand. We looked at those to understand which programs exist and what is needed to integrate the data further. Um, we've been looking to understand the long term mangrove observing that is currently happening in the world. And out of the 346 active long term observing programs found, 15 um, conducted in situ sampling of mangroves. Out of those, all of those use best practices actually, but we do need to work towards basic and, and a complementary set of practices that can be used across local studies so that they can be aggregated globally and also acknowledged globally and used for global agreements and decision-making processes. 70% of those 15 observing programs um, sampled yearly or more frequently, which is great to see the short term and quick changes that we talked about earlier in other presentations. And half of those, but only half of those have openly accessible data. Out of those that do not have openly accessible data, most are working towards it, but often the reason that they could not make it openly accessible is insufficient funding. 
So what we need is the globally coordinated and sustained measurements to meet the quantitative needs of these various international agreements I was speaking about earlier. But the landscape of biological data globally is still relatively fragmented. As such, collaboration requires coordinating frameworks. And on this slide, I'm showing the essential ocean variables and the essential biodiversity variables, which can really act as a framework and as a connecting piece between the biodiversity observations, be that in, through in situ studies, satellite imagery studies, drones, and all of those that are very important, but that need to be kind of brought, be brought together to feed into the indicators so that we can measure um, international reporting and assessments. UVs are therefore best understood as the level of integration between the primary observations and the primary data sets and the indicators of biodiversity change on the other side for any given area. Ideally, these long-term observations that we talked about earlier should be coordinated across regions to understand the larger scale and the national and regional changes in biodiversity over time. We may be able to make mangrove data better findable and interoperable and also accessible for policymakers and for decision makers by ensuring that the mangrove observing communities use best practices that are standardized and data and metadata standards that are of a high quality and also by accessing more open data to facilitate the reporting of international agreements. So here you can see how mangroves are one of the core um, EOVs and they feed into all these other, other habitats that are equally important. And, but those EOVs usually go beyond just the extent and the distribution of mangroves and look more also on species composition, biomass, um, density, and all these other very important variables. And the UN decade of ocean science for sustainable development kind of aims to bring all of this together. The ocean decade can provide an opportunity for scientists, researchers, policymakers, and all other stakeholders to come together and really collaborate in their data management. Sustainable management needs to be underpinned by sustainable science and understanding what is happening, where it is happening, and at which pace is important for ocean management. And just to wrap up a few take home messages. Mangroves are really at the heart of international agreements and they need to be preserved for all the great benefits we gain from them. But there is no one perfect data set that can meet all our needs. Coordination is key to achieve the ambitions of the UN Ocean Decade and is key for policymakers to have easily accessible statistics that they can use for their um, reporting requirements. So everyone has a role to play, whether it's in situ, aerial, satellite imagery, all these different ways of gaining mangrove data are important to be aggregated together and um, give us a more fuller picture of reality. So open data, best practices and metadata standards, such as those from the, from the EOVs can really support robust indicators. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. So, um, well, we can start the discussion. Um, Ryan, do you want to begin? <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. Um, so there's a, a number of uh, great uh, comments in there. Uh, I think one of the one of the big ones um, that I would I would like to discuss is. Um, uh, Basically, how do um, how do we get everybody that's here? How do we get these uh, whatever 150 people that have attended, 250 people that attended today to get involved with these efforts? Um, so a lot of people were saying, "I have this data," um, you know, "How can I use these technologies?" Um, things like that. So um, I think that's a, a big outcome of today. Should be uh, how do we how do we get everybody involved and how do we get everybody moving forward in, in the same uh, kind of on the same ship to save everything? So. Uh, uh, if anybody has any thoughts, I think that's a big question, but I think that's uh, an important one um, that uh, maybe you could, everybody can address. I think uh, initially, uh, those who feel data, as I was mentioned in this morning session, um, to reach out to people like the Globe Mangrove Watch, um, I know that they're very keen to um, assimilate as much data as possible into their own verification methods. 
um, and I know that they um, will gladly take any um, local scale uh, field data or maps that anyone has to, to help um, improve the, the kind of global scale products. And maybe also on, on the point more of how do we um, get local people to uh, gather good data and collect good data um, and maybe validate data for us? Yeah, that's a potentially more challenging um, um, question, but I think there are some uh, great initiatives out there, some great resources for um, doing uh, some really uh, great local field campaigns. Um, I know that um, there are certain organizations like Sevilla who do uh, outreach and learning um, sessions for, uh, for for different um, like local scale projects, so help people to use remote sensing data themselves. Um, and then I'm sure there are similar um, initiatives that help people get into the field and. Um, really kind of get that science quality data that, that we need. Astrid, I know you have a lot of experience with this. Um, do you have any, any Yeah, comment? building on this, um, I think kind of like how uh, Nathan mentioned how we have Global Mangrove Watch, um, excuse me, Global Mangrove Alliance. Um, a lot of the projects that we have there, um, we're working on uh, creating almost like a clearinghouse of methodologies as well. And so, I would say at least on a small, very local scale, right? Um, it's really important to be able to kind of connect with the people who are actually on the ground and who are doing this work. Um, and that can take a lot of different shapes and a lot of different forms. Um, but if anything, that's something that we've learned out in Mexico is to really work closely with the government um, and the folks there who are you know, who need this data and are handling this data to make management decisions and to establish channels where we can build capacity, where we can ask what their needs are and be able to address them. And I think Lola, do you want to contribute something? Sure, I, I just wanted to follow on on what both Nathan and Astrid have said is because, um, you know, we have some people who are more on the side where they're really interacting with um, people on the ground, and then some of us are really more focused on, you know, developing these products. And so I think one thing that um, in some ways the Global Mangrove Alliance has allowed is that it's bringing us together, which is really great, and it's helping us, uh, those of us who are primarily on the product development side, kind of know, okay, what is it, what is it that you actually need on the ground? And so that's actually in some ways how the Global Lost Drivers map came, up, came about, is because we were talking to people and they said, well, we really need to know why mangroves are being lost. And we said, okay, well, maybe we'll try to see if we can start working, prioritize our next project on that. Um, so, you know, I think also having this interaction is really important, having people, you know, kind of tell us what it is that they're, that they really need. Um, and then, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm always a proponent of open science. I think it's really important, which is why I tried to show some of the apps that we did and some of the, um, try to share links is that um, it's really important to share your data sets when they're, when they're produced, when they're published, you know, they get lost in a, maybe a scientific publication. For us, it's, it's great, it's interesting, but when you're on the ground, you're not reading those publications. You really want to know where to get the data. So I think making those linkages people continuing to remind us, you know, this is what we need and where can we get what you've already done. Um, those are really things that are very important. And, and you know, I think that that's one of the, the strengths that having this alliance is, is doing is that it's combining the scientific side and then the people who are on the ground together. And Caleb, do you have any thoughts on, uh, you know, how large companies like Microsoft and Google's and uh, Facebook's and things like that can, can help out in this, these efforts? Yeah, good question. Uh, this is kind of my fifth my fifth week here, uh, but again, sharing uh, sharing data I think is a very very important component, um, and also compute uh, compute is something that is necessary when working with these huge global scale uh, data sets. Um, so uh, I'm a massive fan of tools like Google Earth Engine. Uh, and interactive web applications that can get the both data and compute into the hands of local stakeholders uh, and experts in the same sort of platform. So I think that's a very cool direction that we can move forward with. 
Yeah, the, the visualization aspect, I think, of all of this is just really, really stunning. And um, all of that is becoming uh, a lot easier these days. And I think that actually helps a lot in terms of, uh, you know, making action into policy, right? So getting all of this to actually convince some people that this is a, a problem, right? So we see what Lolo was showing today on erosion, right? And that's a really compelling thing that I think most people can, can understand. Um, so I think those sort of technologies that, um, you know, not only allow us to look at the data, but actually visualize it and visualize it in a way that um, um, a layperson can understand is, 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 is really important going forward. And some of the other questions um, that we had, I think um, kind of revolve around um, just the technologies themselves. So a lot of these technologies, um, you know, if you, if you haven't, if you're not familiar with them, they may seem like almost like science fiction, right? So um, NASA shooting lasers from space, perhaps we shouldn't be surprised by that, but uh, you know, that's, that's pretty crazy, right? It's uh, pretty insane what we can do. Um, so what can we do with this technologies? Um, what's easy? Um, what do you think is on the cusp? You know, what is, what is coming within the next year or two? And then what, what do you think would, you know, maybe in 10 years time, what do you think we could potentially do with some of these, these technologies? I'm assuming this is a question for me. Uh, for you, I think for everybody, to be honest, because oh, I think all yeah. the technologies are really cool, right? right. Uh, and, you know, honestly, if I if I wasn't a computer science professor, I, I wouldn't uh, believe a lot of these things were could, could be possible. But yeah, sure, I think your lasers from space is is, is certainly probably one of the, the craziest ones, right? So uh, okay. perhaps can you tell really? us a little bit more about what, what you can do there, what, what, that, what can we do with uh, the satellite LIDAR or, or some other things that NASA is cooking up? Sure. I mean, I, I always enjoy seeing the drone imagery because it's so clear, you know, it's like, you know what you're seeing. I, I really, I really love looking at those data sets, but, um, and, and please everyone else also step in when I'm talking, but it's, it seems like when, I, when I'm looking also at the, the questions that we're getting that um, one of the, the next steps that people are very much interested in is getting species, mangrove species, um, better species differentiation or information. Um, on the NASA perspective, I know that there are a few um, upcoming missions that are uh, planned that will help us better understand what species composition is um, in, all, in all vegetations, but also in mangroves. And, and in many ways, I think mangroves are, are a great, um, not just an example where we can apply these, um, these um, technologies, but it's just been shown that you know, because they are relatively simple organisms in terms of species composition and their location is always in a coastal area. This has allowed us to really advance mangrove remote sensing science. I think in some ways more than many other types of um, uh, terrestrial or aquatic remote sensing science. So to me, I think uh, being able to better differentiate between species composition is one of the, the next steps on the, on, the, um, on the mangrove mapping side. Um, just to follow up with Lola on the, uh, in the next few years, um, well, actually, currently with um, this now two uh, spaceborne laser instruments, um, in a couple of years, we're going to have a brand new NASA uh, radar instrument. Um, and I know the Europeans are following up um, with their own um, radar instruments, and also uh, Japanese space agency have their own LIDAR instrument. So in the next sort of decade, we're going to have a, a massive increase in the amount of volume of data that we're going to get from space. Um, the radar data that we are, the satellite that's being launched in a couple of years, NISA or NISA, um, that mission alone is going to collect more data of Earth than NASA has ever collected for the whole solar system combined. Um, so it's just a, an enormous volume of data. So we're looking really ahead, um, I think, uh, just the different modes and the different, and the sheer amount of data we're going to get, it's gonna really help us unlock some of these um, kind of next questions about what to has. Um, and how to answer those questions. And just for scale, uh, what, how, how much data are we talking about here? How... Oh, so I think um, raw data, it's a couple of terabytes a day, and that scales up into dry products into hundreds of terabytes a day. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think maybe that's then sort of a lead into something that Caleb can answer is, you know, how do we, how do we, how do we deal with all of this, right? And uh, maybe what is behind all of these algorithms you talked about compute and the need for that. Um, so what is the, what is happening there and what is the kind of, what can we see as the future of, of the analysis of this data? Uh, is that for me or? Yeah, for you, Caleb, yes. Uh -huh, sorry. 
Yeah, so uh, I know uh, one thing that the AI for Earth team here at Microsoft is doing is trying to uh, develop this idea of a planetary computer where you can run um, kind of algorithms that you might run now in locally in a Jupyter notebook on small amounts of data uh, at scale across entire data sets. Um, so there's a lot of engineering and infrastructure work that has to go into that, uh, that utilizes uh, kind of Azure on the back end. Um, I know with Google Earth Engine, obviously you can run uh, these giant computations, uh, but having it in JavaScript or Python form uh, is, very, is very useful as well. Uh, so to kind of summarize, developing algorithms with this scale in mind is necessary and having the platforms from these large companies to run it over uh, many many terabytes without having to you know, develop the knowledge of the parallel programming that you would need to do this by yourself is very important and also from nasa side too it would be great yeah and also from the ecological side of the of the problem i don't know if steve is still with us here but uh it's very important to what what do you think about the opportunities that technologies like drone is is giving us to understand better the ecology of a lot of biodiversity that uh, use these ecosystems and until now satellites is are still far from from that. I, I you mentioned that the small patches are not part of these um, um, databases, uh, but they are very very important for the connectivity of many species. Yeah, so I I think it's a matter of <clears throat> coordinating at the local scale because drones, you know, have have their niche. Uh, we need to be monitoring ma uh, mangroves at multiple scales, and uh, drones provide, you know, uh, detailed analysis of a small area. And it's a simple approach where you can train, you know, th this can be crowdsourced, and and uh, we, it, it's a fairly easy approach to collect a lot of detailed data, and you're able to get the the data that you need. It's personal remote sensing where where you can do it on a regular interval and you can detect changes. And that's really what these smaller islands need uh, to be able to check on a, you know, a regular basis. And, and you can get the biophysical information uh, combining the, the point clouds that you can generate with, uh, with the field data, just a real powerful tool uh, at that scale. And, and, and I think it's important that we, that we develop a hierarchy of, of information flow. So we have regional coordinators that can communicate with national coordinators. And I know we've talked about this with the Global Mangrove Alliance to be able to allow this, this data to flow up and down um, collected at these different scales. I think that's an, an important part uh, uh, going into, into the future. Yeah, and building on Steve, I think not only in terms of the data availability, availability to flow between all these different levels, but also that they're um, complementing each other in a very uh, sustainable way, in a very logical way as well, especially as you know, Caleb presented the promise of having multi-resolution imagery and algorithms um, sh demonstrates that we can all work together among all these different you know, niche spots to kind of push the remote sensing envelope, so to speak, um, both in terms of, you know, the techniques and the tools that we have, as well as the resulting labels um, and the imagery itself. How do you envision, for all of you, how do you envision the, the monitoring programs, mangrove monitoring programs in the future? How do you think uh, um, we can establish better collaboration and coordination between all of these groups and the data transparency, data sharing uh, with all this information. Well, I, I, just to comment on that, I think we need not only the hierarchy working at multiple scales, but also uh, working groups where we have specific research questions that 
that uh, that we're working on. So we we identify those those research interests and and then we work collaboratively based on our our interests. Um, I think that would be a great great idea that the uh, Mangrove Alliance um, could continue to work towards. Any other one? <laughs> Lola. Oh, no, I was just going to say, I, I agree with what Steve was saying, you know, continuing to work together. Um, and um, as I mentioned before, also is to, you know, try to, to have that, that, that interaction or that discussion between the, you know, the, the remote sensing science group or, and the applications users. I think it's, it'll just be a, it's, it's a continued effort and a continuous effort and a continuous interaction and conversations that need to happen on those sides. Uh, if I can jump in, uh, one thing that I would love to see would be a kind of place where uh, ground truth validation points for all kinds of different remote sensing projects uh, could be collected and organized together. So if you do have an algorithm that combines kind of data from multiple resolutions or a new idea, you can test it quickly against uh, sort of a large number of known ground truth points uh, instead of having kind of interpreted imagery as a validation step. And I think that would really, really help everyone speed up. Well, we are reaching the time. Uh, I think uh, some people were asking if the results of the polls uh, can be shared. Is do we do we present the results or? Um, I do believe we presented them, but I can here yeah, for the last one. I can reshare them. Okay, so. And this is one of the, the most important things. Yes, the accessing high resolution imagery is one of the, the uh, limitations. Um, well, I just have one last question and I don't know, Ryan, if you have more questions, but uh, especially for Sarah, uh, how this uh, information, all this technical information that is generated by um, all these fantastic groups doing a great research can really incorporate it to decision making, especially or in particular, for example, the uh, right now the NDCs for countries, the non-determinant contribution of each country, they are very vague and many countries uh, or the governments of many countries justify this uh, emptiness in these kind of documents because in theory there is no information but as we are seeing there are there is a lot of information and actually it's, it's uh, available for for many of these uh, governments so how we can really um, connect all this information with um, public policy instruments like the NDCs so I guess there's a distinction between whether that's on the global level, whether that's, or what's, whether it's the nationally determined contributions to NDCs. And for the national um, level, there should be also collaboration, of course, within the country of these in situ monitoring programs, whether they communicate within just that country, or of course, global data sets can be used. Like the Global Mangrove Watch is a great opportunity now. It might not be, 100% accurate for a very local level, for very local decision making, but on a national level, that would be a great opportunity. And if biomass is going to be incorporated there, that is definitely a good um, information source for governments. And to link that up is, of course, quite a task, but there are ways such as the UN Biodiversity Lab that um, was helping countries in their efforts of the six national reports for the Convention on Biological Diversity. And there are other efforts to always connect decision makers with the data and the science. But as I said earlier, it's a challenge and a lot needs to happen for people to link up and for people to communicate and talk to each other really. Well, if um, there are no more questions, I hope that we can continue 
uh, collaborating and, and increasing all this information. I think, Astrid, are we going to send um, an, an email with the results of uh, all these two webinars? And um, uh, I, I think also these videos will be available for uh, after this presentation. Could, could you tell us something about this? Yes, absolutely. So both session one and session two are recorded. Um, they'll be available online shortly. Um, and you'll get an email actually with those links for those as well. And a couple of key statistics uh, results from this webinar will also be shared. So I'll keep an eye out for that. And thank you so much for tuning in. Well, uh, Ryan, if you have something else, if not? Uh, no, I think um, it's just, it was really great to see uh, people from all over the world, um, you know, interested in these amazing ecosystems. Um, I think we're, we're at a point where we have a kind of an unprecedented opportunity to monitor and understand, rehabilitate these, these mangroves um, at, the, at a worldwide scale. And so these technologies, you know, they, I said earlier, they kind of seem like science fiction, but they're real, right? The presenters have shown that they're real. Um, but I think we need to kind of use this as a start, just a starting point. Um, we need to develop more of these science fiction technologies. And we need to get these technologies into the hands of the peoples that can use them. Um, we need scientists working hand in hand with technologists. Um, we need people with boots on the ground to gather data for us and validate the data. We need these huge computing platforms to um, ingest this data and analyze it. And then ultimately just make this uh, data uh, compelling, uh, present it in a compelling way to policymakers so that we can truly bring about change. Um, so I think, you know, there's a huge challenge here. We, we've laid that out in those two sessions, um, but there's there's a lot of efforts. And um, my, my, my challenge, I think, to everybody is um, to, to go forward and think about ways that we can join these efforts um, and make a much bigger impact. And it'd be really cool if like in 10 years time, we look back at this, this uh, session today and said, you know, this was really the, the springboard um, for an important moment in, uh, in global mangrove rehabilitation. Um, so I think uh, with that, we can say goodbye. Uh, we're a little bit over our time. Uh, thanks everybody for attending and uh, have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much. And thank you, Astrid, Lola, Nathan, Saram, um, Steve and Caleb for all these presentations and all the, the team. Um, uh, thank you very much. and. Bye bye for the next time. <laughs> Thank you. Bye bye. Bye, everyone.